We're going hard with the world's content, so we're back for another episode of Summoning Insight. Got so many different ones this month. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have some more, depending on Thorin's schedule. When will they be? We don't know. He's going to be working the major starting next week, but we'll we'll be able to like shoehorn some episodes in there for the duration of the playoffs. Obviously, quarterfinals going to be coming up in just a couple of days. So let's start with the group stage and a reflection upon people overreacting to best of ones. Like a bunch of Cretans, they take a single round robin of best of ones and then proceed to completely fucking flip out, completely, utterly, totally, and then draw conclusions based on the rest of the tournament, based on the quality of teams. What were your thoughts on this, Thorin? Because we did actually see a lot of teams come roaring back and make it through and have uh, the kind of performance we expected, especially in the second round, Robin. Yeah, the big problem to me is I'm when I say that, I'm not addressing fans, by the way. I get that fans do that. I mean, a lot of people, maybe it's their first eSport, maybe it's their first big sport they've watched. Maybe, they've, maybe they're have from the NFL where it only is one game and you do that. Like, I get it. Look, that's a, that baseline is for a player is understandable. It's the industry people do. There's people that should know better. Like, one of the things I found really crazy was, like, I know there was an old precedent at this when Korea was the best, but with these LPL people just grab a set of fucking nuts and actually, like, use them. Like, why are you going to spend all year, the last three years, actually, saying the LPL's better, but then if, like, FPX loses a game, it's just all hopes lost. Like, uh, at one second before they play the best of one, Doinby's the best player in the world. This is the unofficial best team. They have all the tools to be any meta. And then when they lose, listen, they did obviously get eliminated. But when they lose a game, it's like they just, they throw in the towel. Like, I made this tweet about the Western teams because I feel like the Western players do this as well. Like, I think, listen, I never actually predicted Team Liquid would get out or that Cloud9 would get out. But I told you they had a chance. Not least because it's best of one, but also because, like, it's a different meta. They have good players. Again, why are we acting like they're fucking dog shit players from some country you've never heard of these are legit players so the thing i found so disappointing is people after one round of the best of the round robin one phase after three best at ones monty people had written all the teams off that went one and two or zero and three and by the way anyone who went like two and one and looked good was now like a tournament favorite like gen g mate was just going like it's like boop, 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 boop. it's like a fucking what is this what is this so I've got a crazy idea for you if you're an actual expert about League of Legends. Look at the fucking team. Stop going off what the weather was yesterday and going, rain yesterday. So it's good. No, that's not what it is. What you do is you ask, where do you live? What is the general trend of weather? What th what factors would contribute what weather meta it? are we you know, in right now? Are we in the exactly. summer weather meta? Uh... <laughs> they don't ask. They apparently don't ask, Monty. Because I have to say, the LPL ones were the worst for it. Because I actually felt like it's the LPL and the LCS fan, the analysts. They were the ones who would just... If, 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 I said it on Twitter, but I think this is real. I don't think they actually do totally give up like that. I think actually, if you ask them privately, some of them would be like, I think they've still got chances. It's like they it's like they're so sick of online culture where all the plebs just run to donk on you. People who said nothing about a game just go, huh, just didn't hear draw. It's like, where's your tweet saying they'd win? It never exists, by the way. They're so sick of that happening that it's like they try to preempt it. So I saw this with the LCS casters, the the best. Like I could go and I could make a million of those meme format shot chaser posts just using Azale's Twitter feed. Because dude, it would go like this for real it would go from like uh cloud nine they're probably not gonna win this game so we did it we did it like holy shit dude this is 35 minutes of past what is possibly going on here like this is mental and then also by the way i'll just throw this in there like it's become like cool for lcs casters on the broadcast to just sort of make it like they've got no chance at all why is that cool like, here's the thing. If it was real, if, like, if Cloud9 had, like, a 1% chance against FPX and down, I'd get it, right? In that scenario, I agree. You should actually, in, in some ways, make a strong case so that if the 1% happens, it's legit. There were never a 1% chance. In a best of one, by the way, assuming we're talking about top Western teams, I would estimate you're never worse than a 20%. Underdog. I would get it almost all. Think about it, right? Has no one ever watched the bloody LPL and LCK? When they play best of threes in those leagues... Does the dominant team win every single time 2-0? Of course they fucking don't. We all know they don't. We know that sometimes you win an amazing game one, game two, you shit the bed, then game three, you just win dominant again. Like, it's, you know, that happens yeah. all the time. Oh, so, so I get it. Listen, fans, they don't know what they don't know, as it were, but analysts should know better. Come on, guys. 
Also, I mean, it, it, just factually, especially with Cloud9, we've already seen the duality of Qu- Cloud9 oh, this year. Look at what fucking happened at MSI, guys. Like, we know that this team can have a very high ceiling. They're individually very skilled, and that can lead to upsets. They upset. They took games off of both of the finalists at MSI. Did they also lose to Australia? Yes, they did. But, like, you can't just say after they go 0-3 that they're, not, they're unlikely to win any more games. Obviously, it makes it very hard. It made their performance particularly impressive. But you have to take into consideration the other factors within the group, such as the group was weaker overall than most people expected. I mean, I tweeted this before the second round robin, but it was like, if you actually think about FPX's performance, then it becomes even more disappointing that Rogue and Cloud9 are doing badly because FPX Dude. looked shit. Like, yes. it, you know, this is, you expect one of these teams to be able to step up and make it out of the groups. And guess what? Cloud9 did because FPX was severely underperforming, had a bad read on the meta. You, t- you know, take, take whatever reasons you want. There were plenty of them to explain it, but somebody was going to be able to get out of that group instead of FPX. And it turned out Cloud9 had a very good second round Robin. And that's just how this team is. They are very unpredictable because they're it's they're they're a, basically a slave to their own demons. They're not really playing against the other team. They're playing against themselves most of the time and seeing which performance they want to put forward. That's how it feels, at least when I watch Cloud9. So there are a lot of, you know, I thought there were a lot of really weird takes. I think Group D was also oh, hilarious, wasn't it? With how it ended up. <laughs> <laughs> three, three, you fucking morons. You all <laughs> literally made it sound like it was all, like Mad Lions was going to win 6 0, and then like maybe, you know, like fucking Gen G could sneak like three. G- Get the fuck out. It's a three three group and everyone fucking beat each other. It was ridiculous, wasn't it? Mate, I, ne- I normally never call out casters, right? And there's a very good reason for that. One, I know that it's a very difficult job, uh, 10 times harder than any fan will ever know. And I know that when you have to continuously speak, this applies to talk shows as well, you say you misspeak, as in you say something yep. like in your brain, you think you said something, you actually said a different name or something. Or you just say something like you, you've got what, half a second to think about it, so you just say it in a, in a very quick manner that you, you don't unpack it the way you would. But with that said, when I see a green just patterns of behavior repeating i will call you out by the way if you wonder why i'm one of the only people who doesn't really call out freak because it's like getting mad at skip bayless you moron what do you expect you know that's his shtick he knows it's his shtick he knows you know that it is and that you keep watching so what do you know he keeps doing it doesn't he and why does he keep doing it because you're giving him the attention so i don't get mad at freak in fact i have to say this here's the interesting thing about freak style every second he's not making the weird sort of like anachronistic or like contrarian comments the rest of his casting's pretty good actually he's sort of grown on me over the years yeah he'll say that one comment but i just go it's freak whatever I just let it go you know I don't have to get triggered but the one I can't handle is Azale right because he actually has the sheen especially because he always talks about being a former pro of like I'm like he's trying to do that role model that you did of like I'm the professor of like LCS like I'm like a very serious guy I, you know, I do a bit of memes you know I'm here to like it's like it's like it, being a it's like being an adjunct yeah. professor at a community college yeah. but sure sure <laughs> but here's the part I can't handle tell, tell me I'm wrong on this I don't claim to have watched every LCS game but tell me I'm wrong from the fucking lock-in onwards because in the lock-in he was saying it was 11 million dollar yawn or whatever when perks played it this motherfucker has gone to that well of perks costing 11 million dollars and used the uh, meme format where you say that any action or kill was an 11 million dollar action kill or champion he's done that again and again only when it's to donk on perks and donk on cloud nine by association and the lcs as a region now here's the problem with that one i almost i, I actually genuinely can't remember ever hearing him say it about sword art ever ever at any point in time and then secondly when perks dominates where's the comment by the way that would be legit if you were even the guy who says that you should have said and that's why they paid 11 million you know what i mean like that's the you've got to make that story like that point otherwise you're just disingenuous like this ain't wwe mate you are like fucking bobby the brain Heen and just some kind who like has to be biased as a character yourself you are a real human i assume like listen we all played up for the camera but if like reckless actually wins the championship i can't go it was actually garbage. I have to fucking give it up at that point in time. Like, <laughs> you have to do where credit where credit is due, mate. You got it. You got to give it up. Because I've heard way too many people do that angle. And it's a quicker side as well. I know it's a meme, but I hope you know it's a meme. If you genuinely think the way a transfer works is you buy an inflationary asset, predicting what will happen this year based on what. That's not how it's ever worked. That's not how it works with cars. It's not how it works with fucking cryptocurrency. That's not how it works with sports players. You're buying what they did in the past few years. That's what makes their value so high that people bid against them. Like, nobody bought perks 
for 11 million for what you do this year. You had to buy him for 11 million because of what he did the last three or four years. So it's even the same with Sword Art, by the way. I never actually expected him to be worth six million dollars. I just expected he must at least be one of the best supports. You know what I mean? That's like the minimum I expect. So I've always thought people also have that totally wacky as well. Like it's the same with any sports player, mate. That's why you get players. I mean, just fucking look at the NFL, mate. Like Ezekiel Elliott, Todd Gurley. Like these players aren't worth the money. But the problem is their owner almost treated it like he was buying the next three years of that. It's like, no, what you've done is done is pay him. Sadly, you shouldn't be the one who ever does the this. last three years. You're last, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you know about running backs, you just paid him for his entire prime, you moron. You know, that would be the analogy I would give. No, nobody, even Jack, expected Perks to actually be like the most dominant player be worth $11 million. By the way, spoiler, nobody is worth $11 million. That's actually why it's even more bad yes. that you'd criticised him. How are you going to shit on people and go, oh, they're just buying like washed up EU players. Oh, I'll just go buy the greatest one of all time. Oh, you're wasting money. Like, you can't win with these people, mate. You can't win. You can't win. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that logic is sound because the real criticism is the fact that $11 million would be spent in the LCS on any player, right? Because no player is going to give you $11 million That's of not. return. Like, you're not going to sell $11 million of jerseys Even or sponsorships or whatever. Like, uh, just to be transparent with you guys, you know, getting a seven-figure deal done for a team in esports is difficult. It's very difficult. And, you know, if you're, if you're lucky as a team, you'll have a few of those going on simultaneously per year. Um, but... You know, that that stretches across all of your teams, right? Across many different esports most of the times. There's a lot of costs associated with housing the players because you're providing their housing for major esports, providing their food, everything like that. And to spend that much money on a single player on a single team is a is an, an enormous investment. Um, and you know, that's what Cloud9 decided to do. And there could be you could make an argument that there's a value here in the long-term prestige of the brand from having perks, is that it's going to increase people's perception of Cloud9 across esports to the extent that in the long term, it's going to create value for the organization. Like you could maybe make that argument, but it's pretty, I guess, intangible. Um, but that said, like if you're if you're going to be criticizing people, you should be criticizing equally about the spending that's going on in the LCS compared to the sponsorships that the league is pulling in. And you should, you know, the real criticism here is that $11 million was spent on a player in a league with declining viewership. Yes. I like, you know, that's the honest way to present <laughs> this, um, is that maybe it wasn't a good financial move. Um, now, to be TBD, like this is a three-year deal, so we just have to see kind of where this goes before we actually can, you know, seriously evaluate it. But at least at first blush, if you're looking for uh, performance, I mean, the thing about Perks is, did Perks have bad games? Did he lose games? Oh. Yes, yes, he did uh, in, in this world. But at the same time, here's the thing about Perks: when it fucking mattered, he won. And he didn't lose that game in spite of having so some a million dollars fall, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Like, there is no the denying. The craziest clutch factor, probably. By the way, yes. I haven't even seen Korea. I think I think it, you can even put him with Koreans, mate. Like, he's probably a top 10 player ever to play League of Legends for clutch factor. It's metal, yep. isn't it? And that's yeah. another thing, by the way. Everyone was doing this thing where, because they hyper-focused on perks, in a way I've never seen beyond, like, you know, LeBron in the NBA or players like that, you know, like Aaron Rodgers, whatever. These sorts of players where people focus on every game and they're never allowed to fail, otherwise everything's for naught. Were you guys really saying, because he didn't carry week four of the LCS summer split, that, like, that meant it was a failure to spend $11 million. If I was Jack, I'd just tweet at you all right now when I've just got out of an actual group of death that I'm supposed to come forth in. I'd just tweet right at you, like, how my ass tastes. That's why I would go, there's $11 million of fucking jelly you need to put in my ass, motherfucker. There's probably just ruined this. Probably demonetized this whole video. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> it's too late to get this to change now, isn't it, Monty? You know, whatever. So and here's, here's, here's the other factor for you guys. Perks has made at least the semifinals at Worlds every year in the last three years. He's made the finals once, right? And there is a very good chance that he makes the semis again this year based on the draw. They got the best draw possible. And so if Perks makes the semis now, what do you say about this? It, it, just a fucking fluke that he made semis at least at minimum four years in a row, despite having many different teammates, now despite changing region and having completely different teammates. If that's what you're paying for, the value is crazy. The value is crazy on that guy. So we'll have to take a look at this in, in the long term because maybe Cloud9 does get a bunch of sponsorships or does get a lot of viewership value from making semifinals at Worlds. Certainly that would power up um, you know, the fan base for the LCS and for Cloud9 in particular and the number of 
you know, hours watched on the content in a, in a quarter and semifinal match is going to be absolutely enormous. So there could be value here. Who knows? It's too early to say. But if you're going to harp on the numbers, you have to provide them holistically um, in terms of what they mean with revenue compared to the team in the league. And at least in Perks's case, making it out of groups is already huge. And he just delivers. He just delivers. You exactly. can't like, it, there's, there's no argument. Like, is it ever, is it always the prettiest thing? No, it wasn't when he was on G two guys. You have very short memories. G two played some sloppy ass games, but in the end, it, you know, the numbers went into the W column. Yes. <laughs> right? I'll give you a piece of trivia because I'm thinking of people that Reddit loves to hate on because let's be real it's because you're not on TSM or Fnatic right? here's two pieces of trivia they're just facts and what's great about morons is I don't have to even add in the context I'll just say the facts and they can get triggered right Jensen has made worlds every single year seven years in a row that would be gent ladies and gentlemen you can go and look up your favorite player he hasn't done as many Perks has made it every single year six years in a row right Again, these are with different fucking teams and teammates. These guys are unreal. The idea that, like, again, here's the genius how people Each do positions. it. Positions. It's ju it's just selective <laughs> memory because what they do is this. I've seen this from how I, this is why it plays on television with sports analysis. What you do is this, right? When it's the player you like, you point out the best things he did. When it's the player you don't, you just pick the worst thing he did. But there's no, there's no like logic to that. So as a result, like, mate, if you read Reddit, you would think Jensen was like the fucking poor belter or something. It's mental. And every single year, even when he looks washed, he'll have a game where he just carries the fuck out like against a world class opposition. Happens every single year, by the way. You're gonna go not every year, Thorin. Every year, even the TL years where he never made it out of groups. Go and look. What was it? Didn't they beat like fucking IG in a game? Uh, they, or maybe it was down one, one of the two in like 2019. Obviously, last year they beat every single team in their group. By the way, two of those teams went top four. This year, again, every single team in the group. Like people are just, it's like they're just taking narratives and like trying to crowbar the one they want to fit. It's supposed to go the other way. The narrative comes from what the game shows you. You don't decide what narrative you want and just crowbar it over the top. But speaking of that, Summit, Summit G2, Nelson, is that it? Do you have anything else on the docket? I, I, just, I just find it so poor when it comes to narrative building as well because the whole thing about Perks, and everyone knows this about Perks, is that he has intangible leadership qualities and intangible clutch factors. And so the responsible way, because we have ample, ample evidence, years and years and years of evidence that he clutches it out and he always makes it. And it's like, did it? Did Cloud9 look super good in the LCS this last split? No. Did they fucking manage to make worlds? Yes, they did, right? So they got to the point that they needed to get to. They won the first split. And so to have this narrative be around Perks' bad performance, you can focus on that. But here's what I would do instead, coming into the second round, Robin. I would say... Perks is clutch. Let's see if Perks can pull it off one more time and build the hype up that way. And what was the being... feature of that, by the way? Yeah, that feature. Like, where? By the way, where are the features in general? How many years in League of Legends? In fact, all games, CS:GO, they'll do the same thing. How many years does it have to be? I know I did this rant earlier this year, and I actually said next year. Spoiler: We will. We will just do this content ourselves with shoulder content. Where is the fucking content? Like, where was the piece about Scout and Faker for that group? Doesn't exist, right? Where are any of these pieces? Where is the piece about Zhao who raw swap into top lane and calling like some sort of fucked up Neo Doinby high reaper hybrid? The entire team around him in a matter that shouldn't even work with the players. Like, where are these content pieces? I don't get it. Because the mad thing is, in League, they've got all the talking heads they need. They've got all the analysts they need. They've even got the production people to make these pieces. But they just don't... What they don't have, clearly, it's not about money. It's not about time. They don't have the ambition. They don't have the desire. Like, they really do think just showing you the game and, like, the analysts say, they think that's enough. I don't get it myself because, like, I've, I used to think when I was young, they went over the over the top with the NBA Finals and the NFL. I'd be like, bloody hell, it's just a game. Like, why are they going... Now I realise, like, it was to create the whole atmosphere that it was epic you'd never know it was epic in some of these games i just don't even there, there is an entire features team i they ha, i haven't seen anything have they done anything i'm i, got, I don't watch everything <laughs> on the broadcast so maybe i missed something but i can't think of anything they did no i don't get it i, I the storylines have just been not pursued at all and it, it just feels like i don't know it just felt to me like overwhelming negativity which 
I know is somewhat ironic coming out of me. It could have even used it. that though, dude. Here's an example. <laughs> Imagine you make a feature for Group A before it begins. And it's not it's not anyone from Group A or fans. It's the teams from the other groups, Monty. And what you're asking them all, all of them, the Asians, the Westerners, you're just asking them to talk about like, who's going to win this group? They're all going to say, damn one FPX in whatever order. Then you're like, did Rogue and Cloud9 have a chance? They would all be like, no, of course not. Here's why not. Then imagine that. What you've done there, right, is this is why Riot would never do it. Oh, I've set the group up so that no one's going to want to watch it. When that week two run comes around then, holy fuck, you have primed those fans to be like, what is going on? This is impossible. Every, even the players thought this was impossible. It would be amazing. You can even use negativity to actually channel into something super positive later if you set it up right. You know, I, what I don't get is even if you... If, it, it could just be very basic. Like, you, you have the players on site... Right. There isn't a lot of extra logistics because there aren't fans there. You know, it's a lot easier to make content in these closed sets um, because there's fewer distractions, fewer, you know, fewer logistical problems. And so what I don't get is like, why not just create a very simple feature of like Faker and Scout discussing each other? And their own history and just edit it together it's it's extremely easy to make these this kind of content um with just two separate interviews where you do this so i guess that's what's it's really conf it's really baffling that the storylines just feel like they haven't been pursued much at all when you have the, the the this amount of access to the players and theoretically more free time because you're not changing city to city like you normally would in a world or trying to struggle with the time it takes to get in and out of these like stadium venues no, with you all the fans. as well from what we did with flashpoint in, in since everyone's gone online if you have the budget like we did you can just get people local to the person say it's someone in germany you get someone in germany you can go and film something upload it and you use it for your feature like here's something i would do i'll give you it for free now there's still enough days left i would be making a feature from the second group a finished monty where i would be getting players who played with perks the previous g2 lineup i'd have yang cost and I'd, I'd go back and i'd get like yarnan and we and then i'd go back and i'd get mythians there i'd get everyone i could right and what I'd, the feature would be is about his intangibles like I'd, I'd be making it basically like fucking dead poets or something like captain my captain I'd, I'd make it fucking sick about how you know he inspires you but basically the joke is it's like the meme about tom brady about how he inspires his defense to just shut down a 30 points scoring team and only scored nine and then he wins the game the joke obviously there is if you don't know the nfl well, you're just fucked on that one but uh basically yeah i do imagine what an awesome feature that would be and this one like, like you're not in pre update he just did it he just did but we're gonna get into it with nelson he just did probably the craziest escape ever in the history of fucking league of legends from a group like this is mental you can't even downplay this shit even just going it's just best of ones even that's mental mate you know in the best of one the individual upset is more likely a whole stack of them in some senses aren't always more likely you have, you have to win like all of them in a row almost like me give me a break yeah and especially when you go oh three in your in your first round robin it is it's fucking hard to get out <laughs> it's really fucking hard and yet it happened all right guys we'll, we'll talk about the games uh those are opening rant here on somebody insight we're gonna take a break get nelson on and then uh, he can give us his two cents all right we have a very precious commodity uh with us on the show today it is nelson he is for sale currently and you can pack so many strats in this bad boy if you're a professional team. So go ahead, pick yourself up a nice Nelson if you need some coaches. Right, Nelson? I guess. I mean, I my situation, I think, maybe changed slightly. But yeah, I think I'm still like open for offers. I so, see you as sort of like I know you I know this is like Western um religion, so you might not know the reference, but I see you as sort of a John the Baptist figure because he was also a preacher, funnily enough, within the same sort of cult that Jesus maybe allegedly was involved with, if he indeed existed. And basically right. what he was there for, Nelson, was to prepare the way for Jesus to come, the Messiah to come afterwards. But he would go and he would preach, and basically he got killed, and then Jesus later on did all the shit that he did allegedly in the Bible if he ever existed. Right. So basically what you do is you go to a team, you prepare the way, you bring them down the, you do the solve part of the alchemical process and then you get your head cut off like john the baptist someone else comes on and they build it up and then they go to worlds and suddenly they're, they're competing so g2 probably go to worlds next year lng this year i can't wait to see where you go next because i want to know what they're going to do in two years from now <laughs> you see awesome. how he's going with the frizzle hey, see what's going. beware of women beware of women named salome by the way they're they're awesome. bad news for you they're bad news she's worse than lena mate <laughs> actually, I, I, oh, actually, I studied in a, 
I studied in a Christian school, so I know who John the Baptist. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Here's the thing, though, Nelson. There's a dangerous first topic that we want to discuss here because if you see my Twitter, something I've actually think is one of the focal points of this whole world is everyone I was talking to from my shows, from experts I respect, commentators, everyone's take coming into worlds, as far as I'm aware, minus I think LS, was FPX is the unofficial number one team in the world. They have the best player in the world in Doinby. I mean, that was mainly a Peter Don one, but I know some people agreed. And they are the favourite to win worlds because they have the team to do it, they have the shot call to do it, and basically people were just sort of like hand waving the LPL fans, like you know, that was just a bad day, or like, you know, our RNG has the clutch factor, or the meta was different, and IDG, uh, the bad day. And basically, I, I made this comment before World, so I basically said, this is going to be the most overrated number one team to ever go to Worlds because they've won nothing. Like, they actually haven't shown you that they're like a dominant force. Now, yeah, in the regular seasons, they were great. They were in all the finals. Yeah, sure. So I want to get your take. Did you come into Worlds thinking FPX was like the clear cut favorite? Where did you have them? Then I, I wouldn't have, I mean, I don't have like a take because. I mean, all I can say is I can make like the most educated guess on what's going on in FPX. And basically, probably after spring finals, they were, I would say, like no longer a team. So basically, everyone that the Western people said was the number one team wasn't even a team. You failed even the basic fucking premise. Now, what do you mean by that? Though? You think it rattled them in some way that they didn't win that final? They had sure, severe like, internal strife. I mean, they benched Nuggery for a while, right? Yeah, like, that was the thing. He's, he's, he's being cagey because he, know, he knows. He knows the secret. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because... How, 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 now, so let me ask you a different question. Are you good friends with Steak? Yeah, I worked with him. Okay, okay, great. Anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> and known him for many years. <laughs> I mean, like, basically after spring finals, like, they lost. They, they lost the finals in. I th I would say like in a in a matchup where I think they they were favorite to win, rightfully so, because they were like very dominant. And of course, you can see in summer, right? Like there are roster changes. Doesn't matter whether it's like top lane or it's jungle. And the jungle issue has been around for I would say one or, or like almost two years. Maybe you can talk about that then, because there's another thing where I can just tell the Westerners who don't watch LPL. Do the Westerners who don't watch LPL act like from the second season nine Worlds ended, Tian's just been like a god jungler the whole time? It's like, I don't think you've been watching, dude. Like, he's definitely had his massive ups and downs in the LPL. Yeah, that, definitely, right? I mean, he was even, like, benched for, for Bo, who, yeah. you know, unfortunately got banned for, you know, match we, fixing. We know the but, match fixing, yeah, of course. Yeah. But it's like, I mean, he had his issues. Like immediately after they won Worlds, like the season after they didn't do anything, the summer the next year, yeah, they were, they were losing to to my team in the LPL, you know, and it was a very, I would say like it's like one of the usual issues which players face in LPL, like maybe especially after they win like a big tournament. I would say like the general issue, it's like most orcs, maybe if you make made it to Worlds and they think you're a good player, they would try to renew your contract, right? Yes, of course. Like, like, I mean, just imagine that, for example, Fnatic, let's just say, oh, Hill is saying he, he just renewed his contract, but what if they just won Rose? Then you're going to feel very, I mean, you're going to feel cheated. And I think... Yeah, he would feel like I could go elsewhere for more money, right? Yeah, for sure. And actually, this, uh, also famous just generally in Chinese esports culture. There is a famous meme, it's real though, in Dota 2, that if a Chinese team wins Worlds, conveniently one or two players retire and then magically come back six months later because it's a way you just break your contract for a while, you do nothing. And as Elsa says, you just go with somewhere else. You either join different players you want to play with or you just get paid like a motherfucker. Because as we're saying here, unfortunately, you feel like, now, yeah, as you say, like my contract value before I win Worlds and after it could be so different, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and of course, right, like, I mean, he, of course, he had his own medical issues. Whether it's and whether it's like jungle or support, both of them had like their own medical issues. Because I know that Chris, like parts of the or early part of the season, he was like hospitalized and couldn't play some games, which was quite serious. But I think the general consensus for Tian after he won Worlds was that he, basically his mechanics deter deteriorated a lot, and when they changed. Top laners, like they constantly change top laners from Khan to Nagri. The communication wasn't there, and he was not able to like cover them. By the way, I want to ask on that take. Since I asked you on the last show we did about um, 
the fluency of um, Tarzan, because you were saying that he actually yeah. is like, listen, not fluent in the sense that you could speak like an adult, but he actually was like surprisingly done a lot of work in, in learning Chinese. How, what is Nagoya in like that level? Oh, I, I mean, I'm not so sure, so I can't really ah, okay. comment. Fair enough. But but I know that in spring he couldn't understand. It would be very surprising if he could, because uh, Chinese is not really taught in Korean schools very frequently compared to English. Um, so most Koreans speak better English than they do Chinese. And so unless he was studying Chinese prior to having gone to China, which is unlikely, I would say, you know, he's only had probably like nine or 10 months of, of practice in Chinese. And it's quite a different language than Korean, even though they have some of the That's same like words. Dude, that part is always skipped over by people. I don't downplay Doinby at all. It's the other way around. I think people underrate what he does. He works with players who sometimes don't speak his fucking language and wins worlds. I mean, obviously, he technically can speak Korean to them, but not everyone in the team could communicate. Like, that means some of the players... Dude, imagine being in a team where the jungler can't speak the same language as the top player. Has anyone watched the meta for the last three years? How's that going to work? In the current game for the last year, you fucking gank top immediately at the beginning of the game. Like, this is madness. The actual fact they could win is incredible but it also means that when you're having a bad period i could see how it could all spiral and go completely shit makes sense it's the same with ig everyone always dude used to be so confused that ig was having problems it, it should be expected they had problems what's amazing is that they could have times where they didn't have problems and carry with two koreans and a bunch of chinese players that's incredible you got it the wrong way around guys it's like that joke where when the fucking Animal, when the lion in the circus goes crazy and kills everyone. No, that's actually a normal lion behavior. It's when he <laughs> sat on a fucking tricycle doing a little trick. That's weird. That's not normal. You've got it. You've, you've got your hierarchy <laughs> values the wrong way around. What do you think, Nelson? Do you know about lions as well as that top secret? Can you not tell me about why the lion goes crazy? Is it not Sooning? Is it thought that was a reference to Sooning or what Huafeng did? Well, come let, on, me, man. let me let me let me translate Nelson, who doesn't want to give anything up <laughs> okay. here. Okay, okay, fucking hell. The mental, was, the, the, the mental was boom on on FPX. They, you know, it's it's more depressing because you feel like if you actually look at this roster. Um, so, as he said, Tian deteriorated since his world championship. And I think people who pay attention to international competition will remember that Tian and Crisp were probably the best players on, sure. on FPX when they actually won Worlds. So you're, you, you kind of, are, in your mind, are expecting them to be better if you haven't been watching any of the LPL matches since, since that Worlds victory, right? And so... When you also have seen Nuggery last year, you have huge expectations of him. You know, on paper, this is a, a an upgraded roster, you would say, sure. over Khan. Um, obviously, communication issues aside. But also, this was a great meta for FPX. This is just a this is just a wonderful meta for them. Um, doing be the hype around him, why people were putting him as as kind of like the best player coming into the world championship was that he had vastly expanded his champion pool, where he was now elite on a number of like kind of non- typical do and be picks from a few years ago. Um, he looked extremely good coming in. Um, and if you just think about the meta that's developed, oh, it's going to be a top lane meta. Well, thank God we have maybe the best top laner in the world, or at least used to be a nuggery, right? Um, if you think that Tian is going to be up there, then you think, oh, the do and be Tian synergy is going to be really strong. Look how strong the top half of the map is. Do and be has dimensionalized his play style. And not only that, but he doesn't even really have to because this meta actually suits many of the kind of classic do and be roaming champions. If you look at T1, T1 is actually playing a very, I would say, FPX theoretical style right now, where they're playing a lot through Kana. Faker, right now, as of the group stage, is actually, has out of all mid laners that have played at groups, he has the lowest percentage of gold compared to his team. Faker is playing a low economy mid lane style. He's playing mostly Twisted Fate. He played half his games on Twisted Fate, and he's been playing in the side lanes and playing more of a supportive, like, pick-oriented map pressure style. So if anything, like, I would have expected T1 and FPX to look really, really similar um, in this meta, and yet it was a complete and total failure from FPX, whereas, like, T1 is actually doing, like, a better FPX impersonation than, than FPX, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, like, this tournament, they had many issues, especially the second round robin. I, I thought they did, like, average. They did fine on the first round robin. They didn't deserve to win some games, but like, I think they look <laughs> like in C9, right? Game, they should have lost, like, straight up. Yeah, they should have lost, but they were 
they're in a position where if you know Cloud9 makes a mistake, they could win. And then I think against down one, they looked okay actually the first time they played. Yep. But I think week two, they were like in full panic mode because I'm pretty sure all the Chinese teams know that if you don't ban, I mean, you just need to ban TF because that is the only champion which the Western teams can use to contest you. Like, especially early on, especially in the early game, where I think that's the biggest weakness for Western teams in terms of like laning and how they play all the sequences and how the meta is. Where if if any of the Enchanter supports are up in the draft and someone picks it, you would like to follow or you like pick something else to engage, right? But if that happens, then your top lane is isolated. And then NTF exerts so much pressure where you can just pressure both side lanes at the same time the moment he goes missing. And I think they just forgot. I mean, they forgot or they just didn't believe in like banning TF. You don't think cannot, like uh, maybe in scrims they just dealt with it and they were like, ah, we can let it through. It's not, it's not, it's an overrated pick or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I heard differing takes, right, from different teams. Some teams are... It's like, everything yeah, I've heard, by the way. This is why I actually found some of the results surprising. Is based on the rumours behind the scenes, everyone was saying all the Western teams getting dumpstered and, like, no one had a chance against the Asian teams. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's, that's what I heard as well. But I think... I think scrims can show, like, you know, the, the peak or the potential of the team, but on stage, most of the time, it's definitely different. It's a slower game. Do you, do you think that the LPL as a region, because if we look historically, they're another region like NA where the number one seed has a terrible record at Worlds. Like, Except the problem is, Nelson, they're supposed to be among the favourites to win Worlds. If you go look at the number one seeds from LPL, it's amazing how many times they just, not necessarily funk the groups, but they just don't make an impact on being a potential champion. Do you, do you think, like, it, like the obvious question is, like, do you think they get affected by pressure of being a favourite? I, I think there's pressure for sure. Because I remember the year which FPX won Rose, but they started the group like two one, but they all, yeah. they could have went like o two uh, o three, you know. Oh, it's dodgy as fuck, yeah. Yeah, they, were, I mean, the, the players were uh, feeling the pressure for sure, even though they won the game. Like they lost one game and they just felt the pressure already because, like, first they lost to an uh, J team and then yes, they were supposed to get first or they were supposed to contend for the title, but they just. <laughs> screwed up in the first step you know and i i know the i know the whole team was under pressure and trying like not to choke in the second half of groups and yeah i mean for most lpl teams especially those which are not as experienced in terms of like international i feel like i mean i know that most of them are very they are very afraid of week 1 because it's the best of one like they never played best of ones in in their life you know and, and I don't think it's a detail that is mad. You know what? You know we often make oh, the comment for the Western teams that it's so stupid that they're playing best of ones when Worlds playoffs is best of five. It works the other way around, you know, guys. We tell LPL and LCK play the whole year in best of threes. Jokes on you. You have to put, win a bunch of best of ones. We're training no, everyone sense. for the wrong format. You know, like either standardize the format or make something like maybe the summer split oh. has to be the same format. So I don't know. I would make something because I think it's silly the way it's done at the moment. Like I don't know what we're judging when we watch these best of ones. Uh, I think for sure, right? Like maybe, maybe have more teams, maybe three teams out of the groups instead. It's more, it's better. It's a better yes. format. But I think the current format is too punishing because it's, it's just you're just playing best of ones, and anything can happen, right? Or I, mean, I, I think, think the tiebreakers are the worst too, because the tiebreakers <laughs> are like, yeah, no, no, pra no practice or reviews at all. Just start playing. Like, what am I doing now? <laughs> this isn't even League of Legends now. What? It's so cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Random tiebreakers <laughs> against teams that you haven't prepared for potentially. Um, yeah. Now, you would you would argue, oh, you did prepare for them because you played all the teams on the same day, but you didn't know what you were going to see, so you can't go back. It's not creating like a strong, prepared match that that is going to create some quality games. Um, teams are tired. Like, look at that crazy, like oh, four way tiebreaker that we had, that. you know, some of these teams are playing five games in a day and that's, that's the maximum amount of league of legends that anybody plays in a day. And you only ever play that when you go up against one opponent that you prepared for, you don't do five games against three different opponents, right? So it makes it much harder. Not only that, but usually the five games are consecutive. So you've got like a five hour block in these games. 
teams were playing the first and last game of a nine game day. So you're like 10 hours sitting there that you have to be on. You have to be watching these other games. So you're prepared for your opponents. It's, it's ridiculous. And this is the problem. One of the many problems with the format is that it creates scenarios that players have never seen in their lives before, which creates anomalous results. Like nobody ever does this. Like, I, <laughs> I think for sure. I think for sure. Right. Because most of the time, like for example, um, cloud nine's group, they play on, I think they play on first day and the fourth day. But like, for an, uh, just to give an example, like imagine if you lost to Cloud Nine on the, on the second round robin, and then you have to play them in the tiebreaker or whatever. In a tiebreaker, right? But you have to sit through the entire day of games. You might be influenced by your own games against other teams or yes. the games which other teams play on stage, and you're watching. And I think it's it's not an easy scenario, and I don't think like any team like Western or, or Asian they can handle it because you just don't face these scenarios, you know? Well, it, here's here's the most egregious thing about this format, guys, is that, yes, was Worlds condensed this year because of the switch from China to Europe? Yeah, it was, you know? Um, that was unfortunate. The teams had less time to prepare, and we saw, like, not a lot of time between play-ins and, and the regular group stages, and we're not seeing, like, a full week between the group stages and the quarterfinals. So th there has been some level of condensed play. But the thing about it is, the advantage that Riot had this year when planning the World Championship was typically Worlds goes from city to city to city, right? Um, you know, you you play play-ins and, and groups in one place, and you would go a different place for quarterfinals, different place for semifinals, different place for finals. And it takes a lot, right, to move all of that equipment, set up the new stages, move all the players to the different country or different state, if it's in, in the United States or in China, right? Um, different province, I guess, in China. Anyway, you get the point. You get the fucking point. Um, but you don't have that this year. Everything, everything is just in Iceland. So if you have one year to experiment with formats with relatively low punishment, it would be this year. You don't, because there's nothing moving. You know, Shox pointed this out on Twitter to me, which is that you have now three weeks for seven best of fives. We could have a double elimination bracket in this time because nobody's moving. It's easy. We could have more matches over this time period because you're not changing locations and changing venues. We could have had a longer group stage as a result of this. We could have had matches kind of like, you know, with shorter breaks between quarters and semis, for example, but we could have filled that time with double elimination or by expanding the group stage into something that kind of made sense. I mean, you see this with TI that just wrapped up as well. And so because it's all in one location, this was the time, this was the year to test these formats because it's the easiest. It is the easiest you're ever, it's ever going to be. And you can see, I mean, it would work. We know it would work. It's not even really a question, but if you riot, you have to test it to see if it would work because you can't look at any other esport. Um, and you could have just had you this. Invented it. Yeah, you invented it. You invented esports. So right. you could have just had this forever from this point forward, right? And I think that's what's so frustrating about me watching yes. this from the outside is like now is the time to like pull the trigger on that. And then that way you could plan for this in, you know, next year, right? Where you have a year lead time to kind of work out the scheduling. And so I just wish we would have seen it because as somebody who has worked worlds, I know it's it's exhausting to travel from location to location. Uh, I know it's hard on everybody, production, teams, casters, but you're not doing it. You're not doing it this year. This is the year where you can make the format more robust uh, without any penalty. So let, why, why aren't we seeing that? Also, um, if anyone's just wanted a quick update, another team just won TI from the lower bracket. By the way, RIP China again. RIP, RIP. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's and, and, and now, now, you know, that's an excellent point. Why can't we have a double elimination bracket? Because I think Dom put it really well on Twitter. Let me let me pull up the, the point he brought up. For this entire year of League of Legends, we can only get maximum one best of five between NA and EU. And by the way, that's if Cloud9 and Mad Lions make the world finals, which obviously is not going to happen. Um, maximum three best of fives between LCK and LPL. So there was the MSI finals, which we already got, right? But because we're going to see some LPL and LCK quarterfinals, like all LPL quarterfinals and all LCK quarterfinals, the 
you know, there are very few opportunities that we're going to have in order to see the two best regions in the world go against each other. Um, the only possibilities are either RNG or EDG versus Gen G as long as they win. And then the finals, if T1, Hanwha, or Damwon get to the finals, now probably one of those teams will. So I'd say we're, we're, we we're probably likely to see the LCK versus LPL in the finals if you had to predict the tournament right now. But it's egregious that we could have two international tournaments and we only see two best of fives and maximum three, maybe just one if it shakes out that way between the regions. And it, we're just being robbed of seeing the highest level, most hyped gameplay. And if we had a loser's bracket, we would just see much more of it. We'd see much more of it. Any thoughts, Nelson? I mean, definitely. Right? I, was, I was even thinking, like, I think it's, it was even possible to, like, you know, expand worlds. Of course, I'm not sure about the money and logistics, right? You could expand it where, of course, you can seat teams in, like, maybe the first seats, but then you have <clears throat> more teams from, you know, NA, EU, or PCS and the wild cards as well. And to I mean, Nelson, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, this Worlds is way cheaper than the one they planned in China this year because <laughs> no, it, it doesn't require sure. movement of hundreds of people. It doesn't require s renting stadiums and setting up massive new um, stages every time you go to a different location. They have a, a relatively small studio that isn't moving. Like this Worlds, even with all the additional expenses of like last minute moving equipment there and getting everybody on location, this Worlds is probably. 25% of the cost of what the China one is get. That's I'm pulling that number out of my ass, but it, I mean, yeah. it's certainly way, way, way. It's, it's less than 50% of the cost for sure. Right. So yeah, look for sure. I think because in, in season nine end of season nine, what I heard was the like, world was supposed to be in China in season 10 and then COVID happened. Right. But I think their plan was to have the grandest like worlds in China to celebrate like 10th anniversary of, of yep. like, worlds. And it was supposed to be postponed to this year, but it didn't happen again. So definitely the cost is like way lower. So so my point is, is that if the costs are lower for this, then you can spend a little bit more money to have a few extra days of broadcast in order to have a double elimination bracket. You're still coming in yep. way under budget. <laughs> You're still coming in way under budget. By the way, one thing I actually found very curious was that statement. You might have seen it where Stardust from T1 said each of the groups from each team from the region that he thought had the best meta read and he picked rogue as the eu team he thought had the best meta read actually so i actually also think there's the other reason why this world's people went way too far what they did is they applied the old model of how you looked at a world's group where you only ever had in, if you go beyond 2019, 2019 and back, you never had more than three teams from a region. So as a result, most groups would have like, you know, a team that borderline can get out second or third. And then the fourth one There's some groups where that one has no chance. And then there's a dominant team in this one. Right. Yes. Group A was a group of death on paper. Right. But here's the problem. Even the worst team in that group had a chance in the way that probably they never have in any other world's group ever in history. The worst group, the worst team was Cloud9 and they had one of the most clutch players of all time. The third best team in the group was a team that was in both the LEC finals. Like, I don't think people have actually also upgraded their model in their brain of what these groups are like now. Like, as we saw, there are now going to be very few groups ever that really are just cut and dry. Team A will always win. Team B will always win. Team A will get 6-0 this team will get zeros that isn't going to happen that is not going to be the way worlds is because i thought the rogue and cloud nine one listen they weren't supposed to be able to get out of their group but the idea they had no chance like that already was kind of whack to me anyway and it sounds like within the tournament i mean because they didn't get out people have sort of forgotten about rogue but it sounds like rogue was one of the teams that made use of this boot camp or managed to level up from week one what did you think of rogue overall nelson uh, i think on the second second week they play, they definitely play a lot better second and maybe on a different day they could have won but i think when there's something on the line i think rogue always loses it but i think i was that, yeah yeah but i was like pretty disappointed with their week one performance especially from the top side of the map i think hans oh, of course i think hans has been like smurfing the whole event like that definitely proves to be like the best ad right sure and the guy going missions, by the way. Again, Reddit love to bang on Jensen, Perks, 
Larson. Oh, I didn't hear it. I couldn't hear a fucking peep out of any of your mouths about Larson on that week. What happened? What happened, boys? Against what your literal top two teams in the world? What happened? Did he? Uh, did he? Oh, I he tripped over and smacked him. Did he? Oh, fucking hell! What happened? Did baby get smacked? Ah, oh, drop your bottle. Did you give me a fucking break? Like, but why do people do that thing? Because I, I tell you one thing in American sports culture, I hate Monty, is where they take being clutch. And that becomes the only factor in the game. And everyone clutch is treated like they're 10 times better than the guy who just isn't clutch. Like, the whole reason we're having that discussion is they're right there. It's just that sometimes that factor comes to play. Well, in the best of one, it isn't necessarily always about even being clutch, is it? Like, you can just turn up and have a good game. And as as people saw, there's a reason why Rogue was always good at best of ones. They turn up and sometimes... I've, I've always thought their problem, dude, isn't even just like, yes, in series, I think they have a problem adapting between games. But for me, it's when a game is lost that they get mentally broken. Like, in some of these games, they just looked fine. They just played them like they were normal games on week two, and some of them went really well, and they won those games. I thought it was pretty cool all in all. Yeah, I, 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 I think sure. I think week two, they definitely it was definitely different, right? Inspired was playing differently, and Larson was performing like a, a normal LeBlanc. I think his LeBlanc on week one was horrendous, and he 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 is a player who like likes to play LeBlanc, as far as I know, at least from my players. That's what they told me, oh. and I think that's like one of the small steps he took to improve, at least for week two. I mean, I think I think like. Overall, this meta didn't really suit Rogue because even Hans's incredible imp performance like couldn't pull them across the finish line. And I th obviously, Odoamne was was pretty underwhelming so far this tournament. But that wasn't Larson the greatest call when I did that message to him. <laughs> <laughs> I might stop doing that because it's actually just a good. Uh, I don't believe in curses, but I do believe maybe I'm getting in people's heads. I'll, I'll, I'm the anti coach. Uh, yeah, I think you can do it. And then, oh, bloody yellow hopes lost, right? Fuck yeah, it. Then I guess you better send your messages in like Chinese and Korean. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, I, I think, I think though, he was also given some really tough top lane matchups that I didn't really understand a lot of the time, like trying to play the rumble into the Jace. It just seems really doomed, you know? And I, I think Larson too, perhaps wasn't criticized enough because he actually had the lowest damage percentage of any mid laner in the group stage compared to his peers. And Faker was number two in terms of lowest damage. But the thing is, if you use the eye test on those games, Faker was having a lot more pressure on the map. And also Faker played half of his games on TF, whereas Larson played half his games on Rise and LeBlanc, right? Like his, his, pickups were three games of rise two games of leblanc one of tf one of oriana and one of silas which is like you kind of expect the player to have a bit more of an effect in terms of the damage score in those scenarios and not only that but he was kind of like a statue in the mid lane too where he has a 58 percent kill participation which is again you know bottom three uh, among mids so he he it, there wasn't these picks were not actually translating into damage or kills or objectives on the map he was just he was he was just kind of there a lot of the time um and i think that part of the issue that rogue has had was just a complete lack of proactivity within these games i think like these picks like you know rise leblanc they probably don't suit him as much because i, I think it's fine for him to be like you know a statue or or a turret in the mid lane i think his but they have to draft on a way where, you know, he's probably playing Oriana. He's just going even. I think this worse. he was, at least in lane, he was not doing like as bad compared to previous worlds. And his, I think his Oriana game was great. And I, I was expecting to see like more Oriana games, but they, I guess they didn't want to draft it. Because I don't think Rogue has like a strong enough top lane for them to like give up mid lane and play stuff like TF. Right, you know, and just constantly roam top and help top lane snowball. I don't think that's the place. I don't think that's the way for them to win. Yeah, I mean, I was also just disappointed that Odo Amne, who is a player that we've known on Kennen for so long, we only got to see the one Kennen game out of him too, and instead they were prioritizing like Jason and Rumble picks. Um, so I, I felt like they had really like pretty strongly veered away from what we typically know these players to do. I guess the exception would be Inspired, who actually did have a couple of games on the Fiddlesticks, one of which was kind of a train wreck, and the second one was good. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, outside of, outside of Hans Sama, it was, it was a pretty underwhelming performance and it makes me feel bad for Hans because <laughs> it seems like the performance he put in was kind of wasted. He was exceptionally good and the rest of his team just couldn't keep up with him. Yeah, for sure. And I think he's like kind of unlucky as well. Cause I think like this world, they have, sh- it has shown that, you know, like bowling doesn't really matter at worlds because I mean, if you watch the games like the Met against LNG, the last game, I mean, Kazi was just not farming for like 10 minutes and he can still win as as long as your top laner is ahead. But I don't think they have the top laner who has like the laning, laning prowess or the ability to play that way. He, yeah. he means Rourke when he says that at the end. Yeah. Of the oh, right. And, right. and, and, and by the way, on. and by the way, you can, you can really tell how meta dependent some teams are at worlds and the changes that riot makes between the end of the season, when teams qualify for worlds by playing in their respective regional playoffs, and then they come to worlds and then they just look magically better or worse. Like if you think about it, if you think about the teams that have had really good 80 carry performances, well, rogue is one right it, it worlds. Um, Hanwha life is another one. Deft has been playing well, uh, overall, probably the strongest single member of his team. Um, these FBI, another one who probably was one of the better performers on, on hundred thieves. And yet all of these teams share some very interesting coincidences. Their top laners are Odawamne, Sunday and Morgan and hmm, weird. They're not, they don't seem to be doing very well, even though they all of their 80 carries are having some pretty impressive performances. They're not actually able to get you know, to really carry them to the very top of the standings. And Hanwood was frankly, like kind of lucky to make it out of groups and the other two teams didn't get there. So it's, it's tough. I think in this meta to not have a very talented top laner who can play a lot of the big carry champions and has flexibility. And I don't think any of these teams really suit that style. I mean, the, the thing is like, I think during uphill spring finals and at MSI, I think the meta was like this, almost the same, you know. The me- the meta was almost the same where the best team they just piled everything topside. And if if I was in China, like for sure everyone was gonna try and imitate the champions. But in my time in LEC, like no one actually tried to play towards topside during the regular split. Oh. And and it was only like near the end where they decided, where some teams decided to play more towards topside. And I think this. I think it's just very simple, you know, just uh, other teams had more time. The Asian teams had more time to learn how to play towards top side compared to the Western teams. By the way, yeah, another course, team, yeah. yeah, go on. Another yeah, team that course, actually right. d- didn't get out of the groups that I wanted to talk about is Team Liquid. Because here's the thing, again, how are people just going to make it like this team was going to go 0-6? and six? Like, If you looked at that group and thought they were going to go 0-6, <laughs> you just don't understand like player strength. Like, It's a best of one against regions you haven't played. Like, You can trip over. Like, You think someone like Jensen can't have a pop-off game. I mean, you saw it in the fucking tournament. Can Alfari not win a lane? Of course he can. Can fucking Gorgia J not make some like, clutch move? Of course he can. Like, Listen, TL has all sorts of problems, but if anything, it actually shows that beyond the super mega elite teams, the parity between the like lesser Asian teams and the Western teams that are the best, it's pretty good actually. Because I still think Team Liquid, even at the end of this group and the tiebreakers, still looked like a team that had like disconnected elements, didn't always act in unison. But just look at the strength of the players though. If you give certain players certain picks, you know they can perform. You know they can carry the game. They're still good enough. Like think about this. Team Liquid not only beat every team in their group, they had a whole bunch of games they lost that they were in decent position or like at the mid game, it's even. Like if this team actually had any cohesion, holy fuck, they could have done something big at this tournament. They could have been a legit, like, not a contender, but a dark horse, potentially. I even still look at it. I know people are going to go, you're harping on this, right? Again, two of my favorite positions in League of Legends are top lane and ADC. And if there's one thing I fucking hate, it's top lane is you can't lane. That's your entire motherfucking job for 75% of this game. And it's ADCs who don't walk the line. And what I mean by that is you must step forwards to almost within range of the opponent. You can put the fucking circle on the indicator if you need to. Step forwards within range, do your damage. Then you try and do the, the careful dance of stepping back so you don't get hit. 
Right, here's what Tactical does on Team Liquid. He goes all in and dies and gets blown up instantly, or he goes on the back like old school reckless and just watches people die two metres in front of him and he has never goes within distance to shoot them. Go look at that last fight when they were around the inhibitor, right? It was fucking a joke, mate. Like, what was he doing in this fight? Like, he's just watching people die and it's mental. So I, I, I have to say, the, all the players in Team Liquid at certain times have their moments you can criticise criticize them or you can say like Jensen or Farage maybe they didn't step up or they didn't get the CS sometimes but the problem I have with tactical is it's like mate this isn't like it's his first split. It's not even his first year. Like, this guy's had his time. He's not a true rookie anymore. He's been to all these bloody worlds. Like, he just doesn't get the position ADC. Like, he has skill, clearly. But he just... It reminds me of when Cordy Sun was on 100 Thieves and he was just shitting the bed off the time. It's like, dude, your role is ADC. You have to do consistent DPS. Those two words are the, consistent and you must do the DPS. You can't do DPS sometimes and sometimes carry one fight and then die. And it can't be inconsistent. By definition, your role is about consistency. And this guy doesn't have it. Like, Elsa, am I, am I going too far? Do you think he's good? No, I mean, I, I don't... Like, firstly, I don't think Tactical played well, but I don't think he was, like, the main reason why they lost, right? I think... Like, I mean, I remember mentioning it on, like, the crackdown where... See, but like depending on draft, you know, I think TL has a decent chance, and they did for sure. I think they should have won the the, the game against Genji. Yes. Yeah. But the thing is, like Alfari had such a huge lead, and in, instead of you know trying to constantly help Alfari, it was like what happened was Alfari was like grouping with his teammates, trying to force things when there's nothing going on, instead of extending his own lead, like. There's no way with such a huge lead he had that he couldn't take the tier two towers from yeah, the top lane, you know? Because I think he was so far ahead that Tactical could be FK for five minutes, just send four people top side and take the top tier two, and Tactical loses top uh, bottom tier one and you still win out. And I think it was mainly like a macro issue where they didn't play towards the, the side lane objectives because I think Summer Split they changed where the, the towers were are worth like a lot more gold. Yes, and that's what they, yeah, that's what they should have played towards, right? And yes. I think Centaurin as well. I think early games he was looking very clueless, and it didn't help for sure. But definitely they could have won. They should have won the the tiebreak game against Genji. Yeah, I thought so as well. I mean, I, I will say as well. I, can, I actually want to get your take on this, Monty, because I get torn on it. Because on the one hand, I do think sometimes Alfari. I think sometimes he goes a little bit too ham, but I also think on the team he's on, it's like, dude, read the room. These guys aren't going to follow you up, mate. Like, the second you go in, if they see the fight, they just back off. My joke is that, you know, when I always used to complain at LCK, they try to be as efficient as possible and do a triage in the middle of a team fight and be like, actually, back off. Even though one of us, like, the support will die as we back off, you know, it's not worth taking this 5v5, but it's not like a big edge to us. It's like TL does that, but every team fight, it's mental. They just don't, they don't commit. I, I think that Alfari's leads were kind of wasted on, on Team Liquid. I think that there were there were opportunities to really push Alfari forward and like allow him to dictate when these fights occurred. And yet it felt like that wasn't the game plan that Team Liquid was was after a lot of the time. Um so I, I think overall it just seemed like a disconnect to me overall when it came to Alfari and his teammates and what the strategy of the game was, because he was actually getting really significant early leads. I mean, for a team that for a team that lost at the end due to the tiebreaker lost more games than they won. He was consistently ahead in the laning phase. He, he, he was second in terms of gold differential at 10 in those laning phases. He was getting solid advantages. He was putting out a lot of the damage for his team and other teams at this tournament have been able to convert those top lane advantages into wins, and Liquid didn't do that. I think for sure, like I think their meta read, or at least what they drafted on stage, was very like extremely inconsistent. You know, like like they kind of knew they had to play towards Alfari, but one game they drafted Jarvan into Cannon. Yeah, it's a good matchup, but in the end, he's waiting for a tactical to carry, and yep. probably not going to happen. And then. The other game, the, the Jays game, he he got ahead, and then he tried to help his teammates where his teammates were supposed to sacrifice for him. I think like Here's that's the thing. Where it kind of went wrong. 
I have a different philosophy, and it's a little bit fucked up, Nelson. Some of it comes from personal baggage. Some of it comes from the type of players I enjoy watching. I like players that know when to be selfish. I like players, like I'll give you the basketball analogy. I like players like Kobe Bryant, where what they do, Nelson, is at the end of the game, in a normal game of basketball, you're supposed to follow certain principles. You're supposed to pass the ball. You're supposed to hit the open man. You're supposed to like use the fact that you're the star to draw a defender to you and open your teammate up. That all makes sense during a normal game right but if i have to win the game i like the guy who goes get the fuck out of my way to his teammate and he just takes the shot because he knows he's the best player in this team i hate what you've just described there where it's like you're right if this was like you were using robots and we were in ls's world the way they played that comp's correct you actually should just like tactical carry the team fights it's just like have you got no fucking memory are you goldfish that like, he doesn't carry these team fights what are you talking he had like one game i can remember where he carried the tristana game was pretty good i'll give him that one like aside from that why would you put all your eggs in the third best laning basket that you've got? You want to put them in the best one? Like, they need to take some lessons from fucking RNG. I love RNG. Because Xiaohu just goes, look, if we win, it's all because of me. And if we lose, well, it's all because of me as well, but you guys couldn't have won the fucking game. I love that. That's exactly what I want. I want, oh, basically, here's the problem. Alfari wasn't toxic enough. If Jack couldn't take it, I want, let's see who can get fired next year. You need to become more toxic. I need to get, I'm going to go back in time and we're going to go back and it's going to be like, you know, like fucking in a Game of Thrones when they like went back in time with the fucking three-eyed crow and he was like visiting all like mem mem past memories and things in his genetic line. We're going to go back like that and I'm going to take him to key points in history. I'm going to go, this is a man called Nuke Doc. Oh, I know it's his first split, but he's arrogant enough to believe he will kill Faker. Let's watch it play. Then he does it. Like I'm going to go back through all time, just show him all the most fucking this toxic is, This is forgiven. This is Ethan. This is Ethan. Yeah. <laughs> this no, is I like, mean, like Dickens writes, writes the League of Legends World Championship. You are you're like taking him to the ghosts of worlds yeah. past and looking at all the history so that he can become a good player. Except instead yeah. of he's like Scrooge, except reverse Scrooge, where he's becoming more of an asshole instead of less of an asshole. <laughs> That's the problem, dude. For real, if you ever talk to these players, I know he does a good job memeing that he's like cocky on Twitter Alfari is cocky in the sense that he knows he'll get his CS and he'll do well in his matchup he isn't the guy by the way who's going to go to his teammates and go you guys are fucking up just, just basically do what I say and we're going to win the game he doesn't do that it's actually very rare the players who do that by the way you either have to win all the time in which case you can do it if you like perks or someone other than that people think that they're the asshole if they do that it's not I always tell players this is what I've told every great player I've ever been friends with I tell them in that scenario you're actually being selfish if you don't demand the ball because if you're the best player and you have the best matchup and you have the lead you're the only fucking one who can get the high yield chance of winning the game Game. so it's actually your responsibility to carry the game now true in other games there'll be times when it isn't but in that scenario by then getting like a guy who sucks and going you can have a go now at winning like that's actually being selfish you're acting like everyone's equal we are very much not equal you know, I know you fucking kids do that mean but like he has built different like a guy like that I want him to have a cocky attitude just to I mean, put in perspective, yeah, two more if, games. If this is, but this is how stupid esports is, guys. If Kobe had been an esports player, he would have been ejected from his team and banned He'd by Riot done. for toxicity. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, he'd be done. <laughs> Maybe Alfari just knew that, you know, he, like after the Mad Lions game, he still had two more games. So if he was too toxic, maybe it could be Jenkins. You know, <laughs> he didn't want to ruin his roles. The irony is he did play the team fights like he was fucking Leroy Jenkins. He just ran in first and then they all just watched him and they were it's like they were watching, thinking it was like a spectator, like like they were in the fucking client, like when he could watch Dota 2 like that with VR or whatever, like, ooh, that's bad. Oh, it's nasty. He got CC there. He's probably gonna get fucked up. Oh, glad I'm not playing on his team. Oh shit, I am oh god. Oh. Give me a break. What were these games? And like I say, think about how our absolute fiestas most of the TL games were in the mid-game. Dude, they almost they almost won this group. <laughs> there was a world where they could have won this group. This is cr that's what I mean. People have got to stop acting like we have these static metrics and like teams are up here and teams are down here. There are very, very few teams in this world's group who were legitimately bad. And there were very few teams who were really good. And also, it, you could also make an argument that they could have made quarterfinals if they hadn't matched up against Gen G first. Remember, the, the seeding for that was done on fucking tie average game length, which we are, we've done it already to death in the past. Probably the stupidest tiebreak system possible. You know? <laughs> it, but it's, it, that's the problem, is that it's the only 
tiebreak system possible when you have best of ones because there aren't any other metrics in league like round differential in in CSGO to go off of. So it is incredibly stupid. But my argument would be you shouldn't even have best of ones in a system where you don't have a reliable secondary tiebreaker because it results in these scenarios. Yeah, for sure. I think like best of ones, I, if only you change the format like, where the last team gets, uh, only the last place teams get eliminated. Eliminate it. Otherwise, I think it's not a very good format for the teams there. If people I think, don't I think get it, it's obvious what you do. You take what Nelson just said and you combine it with what Monty said about double a limb. You make it so that the top three teams go out, but the third team goes to the lower bracket immediately and the others go in the upper. It's fucking it's, obvious, isn't it? Have you ever seen it's esports almost, people? It's almost like that's what they did in the LCS playoffs when they put eight they out of the 10 teams oh, into sh- the playoff bracket. So exactly. we know they know these things. We We have evidence that they have knowledge of how to do this, but they just refuse to do it for the most important tournaments. Like, why do I have to watch? I would rather not watch that in LCS, frankly. Like, I would rather just have a very simple, simple, you know, frankly, not even eight team. I'd, I'd rather just have a four team semifinals into finals at LCS so I don't have to watch as many bad games. Whereas if you shortened the playoff window for the regions, then we could have a longer worlds with a good format. Also, okay. I'll just put this out there. I hate things that are logically inconsistent. So the reason why in groups we can't have two teams from the same region is because they play all year long. Why would I want to watch them play? Now watch them play each other in the best of five. In the Shut the Give me a fucking break. So I wouldn't <laughs> watch them. I wouldn't want to see them play like four ga- uh, two games against each other, be a once, but I want to watch them play five games and then one go home. How many times do I have to see this? How many times do I have to pray to the fucking ancient ones? I, I'm praying to fucking Cthulhu and all those fuckers <laughs> that somehow I can get LPL versus LCK in the fucking playoffs. Fat chance of that happening. Every bloody year, it's like they stack the side, opposite sides of the bracket. It's mental, isn't it? How many times has this happened? It's so odd. It's, I feel like it's happened half the world, maybe more, maybe two You're thirds of the world. PX won a world championship without ever playing a Korean team. I know, it? I know. <laughs> There's the run back people don't realise. Here's the real thing that'll break your hearts if you ever stop and sit down and look at the meta and think about it. G2 did FPX the biggest favour of all fucking time. They just beat out the Korean teams. I mean, yeah, yep. technically they play. Like, it, obviously, IG beat Griffin for them. Like, give me a break, mate. Like, well, the problem is this. Everyone's going to go, FPX were the greatest teams ever. In terms of, like, the accomplishment, yeah. But in terms of actual, like, eye test, fuck no. Fuck no. <laughs> They just went that they got a big jackpot machine when the fucking meta came around. Ding ding the seven, seven, seven. Oh my god. Oh! And then they're like, you're very skilled. You're very skillful with the jackpot machine. The way that you adapted to the jackpot was incredible. Like, why is it, why is everything fake in League of Legends? Why is everything fake? I mean, yeah, I think maybe for FTX, I think for sure, right? You could say that maybe they're not they wouldn't contest for like the best team of all time. But I think IG for sure can, at least, you know, when they won Rose. I think that was close to, like, one of the best lineups you, like anyone could ever see. I think oh, if you Omega. forget. Yeah. I, I think other than one player, I think everyone else course. At, at, was, like, you know, world-class. Close to world-class. Most, what's mad is even with fucking Bowlan just averaging it out with four people to average his shit out, they might still be the most skilled team to ever play League of Legends. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah. You know what's even well. You know what's even crazier is like when we did that episode of Summoning Insight where we talked about the best players of all time in each position, and KT had four of those players oh, and smash. still lost to IG. So that tells you a lot about IG for sure. <laughs> in fact, that's the part people don't realize. That's that's why everyone goes back to that match and they're like, "What if?" Because it's just the obvious one. It's like, "Fuck!" Either of these teams could have won. Wait, what? What's who was KD's mid laner? Mid laner. Theirs was uh, Pawn. But yeah. it was UCAL at that tournament. If you oh, remember. okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, that was the one player that wasn't that many. It was everyone else, obviously, that we were talking about. Death Matter, t- fucking Smeb, Score. Like, those are like the fucking goats of the position, aren't they? But obviously, yeah. we all know, years before, fucking Smeb must have got that old cursed monkey paw out. And he goes, I just want to be relevant in Worlds every year. And it goes, <laughs> no problem, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no! Like, yeah, exactly. You just don't want to win Worlds, you idiot. What are you doing? <laughs> And also that one where, like, look, you know, normally in esports, right, 
I do love players. Like, I, I think it's gangsters fuck that Smeb had the chance to join SKT after Rocks Tigers. And he went like, no, because what would the point be? I'm trying to beat SKT. That's an awesome story. The problem is it's not as cool if you don't do it. So it's like everyone else in history is just like, shall I join the best? Team? Yes, I shall win all the championships. So like, that's the problem. It's it's not that cool if you don't do it though, is it? Like you have to actually execute after that point in time. <laughs> and he was never the same again. After he also did went downhill, KG. didn't he? Uh, I know, yeah. he went a bit downhill, unfortunately. Uh, all right, here's a question then. What about your old stomping grounds, LNG? Because here's a team, Nelson, that again, obviously had a chance to get out in the group stage here. But like, it felt like this was a team where I feel like it was the opposite of the Western teams. This team it looked like got worse as the tournament went on and certain players just fell off, fell off a cliff, it felt like. I think like almost all the Chinese teams do face the same scenario every year. So we, we, like what I said just now, right? Week one, they are afraid of best of ones and after week one it's like their confidence just goes like sky high because like oh my god this players cannot lane cannot jungle cannot team fight and then for sure this will affect their draft and how they play the game especially draft i think it's very important like they would draft champions where they think yeah i mean it's not a good matchup but i think i'm i think i'm like a better player so i can play that matchup and it didn't turn out to be the case right especially for lng and I think for they them, to make Yumi look balanced. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, for for them, I know it's. Uh, <laughs> I know them yeah, like right. more. <laughs> I I know them more <laughs> compared to the other teams, right? They, they thought they could just take the Lissandra and LeBlanc skill matchup, or Silas Zoe skill matchup, but I I don't. But I think like that. Why did they get so arrogant? Like, I know the scrims that we don't see, but why would you get so arrogant as to go, I'm going to go Lissandra into LeBlanc against Jensen? It's like, you know, LeBlanc's one of the few champions he carries like a motherfucker on. Like, what are we doing here? Like, why are we giving Western players... By the way, Jensen's even a Western player was a limited champion. Why are we giving them their best champions? Why are we giving him LeBlanc and Syndra? I want him picking TF every fucking game. I want him picking Azir. That, that's how I win the game before it's even started. Like, why? what I don't get basically, Jensen, is why the, why the hubris? Like, why even fuck around? Like, there's so many angles where some of these Western teams, you don't have to do global better thinking. You could literally go in and just go, if I shut these two players down in draft, I make the game twice as easy for myself. Like, I mean, especially, like, uh, Icon, I think it's, I mean, he's, he's a fine mid laner. And he feels he's like he has the auto field role in his team where he just plays everything, right? But yes. he doesn't specialize in anything. Like even like Aurelia against Oriana matchup, I think he just played badly in that. And then he just like lost the team the game. Stylist against Zoe as well. It's a very hard matchup. And you're playing against BDD. You're not playing against like an NA mid or EU mid. And he couldn't even do it against like EU mid against who was it? Uh, Humanoid. I think. I think. And also, I think LNG they had they have many issues throughout the season. I think at the end of summer split, they didn't know how to win anymore, or they just couldn't find any wins. Because I think at the start they were on a ten or eleven game winning streak. Like they were like eleven zero, and EDG was were also eleven zero in terms of best of trees. You know? So I yes. think it was quite an insane streak. But yep. the last five games, they if I'm not wrong, they lost four of the last five, and they didn't know how to play. Because the early part of the season, they were just relying on mid jungle, especially jungle, and then top top lane to just win the game in like the first ten fifteen minutes, and we, and they did so, you know, in the first in in the first week of groups, like, and then I think during playoffs they added some stuff where they decided to play for Harrow and Drake more. They decided to play for objectives earlier, which helped them get as far to like you know top three was great but they didn't add anything more like as far as i know in their mind it's if the game is even we can out team fight everyone but at least from na and eu but i i don't think like that's the way you should think and especially their drafts yeah even though they did get ahead especially against mad lions but their draft was not good enough to like win for sure in the late game there were shift teams Yep. You have anything? Yep. Who do you want to go to now, Monty? You could pick one. Uh, let's go. I mean, uh, let's go to a different group. Um, 
Let's talk about. I, I'm curious about Nelson's take on on EDG because I know he's he's always been super high on Flandre, um, and I think EDG. I, I'm I'm a bit surprised um, that they they dropped a couple of games in the in the second week of competition. I still think they look really really strong and certainly a contender for the title. I fully expect them to beat RNG. Uh, in their quarterfinal matchup, I think their team fighting is incredibly impressive. I think their read on the meta overall has been good. Uh, Flandre just knocking out games on the the Graves and Jace, uh, carrying a lot of uh, a lot of the damage on this team. Um, seems like you know they're doing a good job with Scout playing a variety of picks in the mid lane. Viper didn't die in the first round. Robin was looking super consistent. So I think this team is still extremely dangerous and still the top team coming out of China and should be the team making the finals. But do you have any insight into how this team has been doing Nelson and Flandre's performance? Yeah, for sure. I, I think they are not a team which, I mean, they face the same issue, right? They, this core, this, I mean, Scott and Miko have, haven't been to international events for a long time. Flandre is like his first event, you know, the coaching stuff is completely new and definitely they would face the same issue as LNG where, yeah, they're afraid week one. So so you're going to like try really hard, play really safe. And then week two, you get overconfident. Especially some of their drafts, especially against S SKT. They beat, they beat Faker's Twisted Fate once, but even though they did beat it, I don't, I don't ever think you should open the champion. Especially with, especially in scrims, like TF should be even stronger. And I, I, don't, I don't, yeah. I was curious if you, what you thought of the the T the second T one EDG game because I thought that T one had some really interesting adaptations. Like um, we saw them taking the Lulu against the Yumi, which is like a pretty traditional lane counter. Um, well, team fight counter as well, to be fair. Um, and the reason why, for people who don't know, is that basically if you try and get an auto in, you pop off on the Yumi to like get the auto in to mm -hmm. refill your mana. You can just polymorph the Yumi and kill kill yep. Yumi basically instantly. And then in team fights, especially in this meta where Yumi is really strong, you know, a lot of the reason why Yumi's strong is because in the late game she can power up Bruiser. So if you have like all these Gore Drinker champions that are coming in at relatively close range, like the Talon and the Rise that EGG has, um, Lulu provides the survivability and also can like not use while use use the ult to to knock up those champions and and catch them basically before, uh, while Yumi's giving them the speed. And so it allows you to play these team fights better. And not only that, but T1 also took a look at that and said, okay, we're going to play the Poppy in the jungle, which has been another T1, I think, staple so far of the world championship. And with the high mobility that we're seeing, and you know, if we're seeing a lot of champions with dashes, like Poppy is really able to deal with that. So I thought this was a really fascinating uh, strategic answer to EDG, and I was I was impressed by T1's flexibility. I mean, I don't. I mean, like for sure, right? It was a good, good. I mean, T1 had a good draft, but I think EDG's draft. Like, firstly, I I, I kind of know what they're going for. I mean, Yumi and Talon is like a combo or a combination of champions, which is like extremely strong. But the fact that they picked Talon and Jace when TF already picked Twisted Fate, I think that was too cocky to them because like just like one champion can just corner corner what their comp wants to do, you know? And then like how the game went where where Flandre made a mistake and then they managed to get top tier one. And then from there on the game was over because I think EDG's only win con was for Jace to get really fat or really ahead so that he could like outpoke or poke the enemy team out. But you're playing against a Twisted Fate, and then this this will force you to play like more passively. And then Talon, Talon doesn't do anything when TF is around you. You just press R and you can just see where he is. And of course, you like think, the, oh, but yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, they rounded out they rounded out team comp with you know Poppy, Cannon, Champions, which punish short range. And I just think EDG didn't have a good draft there to win.
All right. The thing is, you, you're just talking stanzas, so I, I never know quite when you finished and when there's still one coming. <laughs> or whatever. But, but here's the question I have: is how would what is, how would you contrast the meta of worlds thus far in terms of stylistically the best way to play compared to the summer splits of like LPL, the general leagues around the world? What what's different about stylistically the way you have to play in our worlds? Yeah, I think it's similar to LPL. It's similar to how RNG won LPL. It's just that. They place more emphasis on her the Herald because the top two turrets are the top side turrets give a lot of goal. But in the end they still set up for Drake's, you know. But like after after Herald is down, I think Drake is like the most important and then the teams or the better teams still set up the side waves, prepare for get a good position for Drake and look for fights there. I think that's what EDG does extremely well. And to be honest, like for for the previous few years, I I think people might feel that the meta has been the same, where mid and top matters the most. But in my opinion, I think it's just it's just that the player gap gets gets displayed the most on in solo lanes. So yeah, I think it's roughly that. But who's the all right? Based on what you just said, which team at Worlds thus far plays that way the best? I think it's RNG. I think RNG plays that way the best. Also, also because that's like the way they have been playing since Spring and his champion pool, right? Yeah, he put out the Syndra. I think I think RNG is like the best suited. I mean, as it, as it stands right now, RNG in terms of heralds has only gotten thirty six percent of the heralds within their game. So, I mean, I, I, I look at I look at RNG and like they're kind of middle of the pack when it comes to like plates per game at five point three. But I think I think RNG is kind of this is a hot take. I think they're I don't think they're going to do well <laughs> against EDG. Like I think that. When you look, when you look at the way that RNG is playing, I think they were early, early on. They've been they've been huge beneficiaries of Xiaohu's champion pool, like being able to play the Syndra into the Kennen. I think is a, a unique and powerful aspect of, of RNG. But I think they're pretty limited out of the mid lane, and I think Cryon is bad, and I think it's going to be very hard for them to make a deep run in this tournament with a player that. As as strong as Twisted Fate is, we see him go to the Galio, which is okay, but not super strong in this meta. And I just don't see the variety coming out of this team that I think is necessary. And at MS at MSI, they relied very heavily on Gala's Kaisa performances in order to to win. Um, and so, even though it does kind of play into their team style and Xiaohu's wheelhouse, they're not they're not like converting the top side of the map into objectives, uh, which is odd. Uh, is yeah, odd, especially because they've been pretty strong out of the jungle too. I think it's mainly also because of the draft, right? Like how they draft around mid lane. Like they 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 know that mid lane is their weak point, and he's usually playing champions which are not extremely strong in lane. But this this sacrifice, like they 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 know that if they go for a gank on top lane, they go and dive on top lane, they are gonna lose the hero, which is which is fine because if Krine is playing like TF Galio and they are fighting on even ground, they're not gonna win. They remind me on some level RNG of actually the FPX team that won Worlds. Because like what, what Zhao who seems to understand that Doinby understood is it hasn't already been about lane and face since about fucking 2013. So it's not, it's just, this is the point I always thought people didn't understand. I'll give you a classic player who did not understand this in the West was the player Genja. Genja didn't give a fuck about how much CS he had in lane. He cared about if he gets a chance to get to his items for the team fight. If he gets a chance to get his item for the team fight, he's playing one of his classic team fight ADC. He knows he has a chance to win. It doesn't, at that point in the team fight, it doesn't matter that you had 15 CS more than me. What the fuck does that mean? I have the items, I can do it. So like, I actually think there's another area Riot fucked up big time with storytelling, Monty. It's like you can actually just serve it up on a fucking silver platter and they still go, no thanks, I'll just have a fucking Twinkie or something. Like, think about this. You have RNG, a fucking org that historically was warped entirely to an ADC who made everything go through yep. him and was willing to lose worlds 
it, to what to play that style you take the mid laner who had to play as the relative secondary carry and a more safe player from mid lane roll swaps to top when that ADC is no longer there and essentially does himself an Uzi eye and warps the entire game top side and then basically also becomes an international champion by the way they both won MSI like this is fucking mental boys like how is there not a feature on this this is one of the best storylines probably ever in like historical League of Legends and it's it's what it just gets what like a passing mental or something. This is a mega storyline. You could even have all those people in the documentary talking about it all. <laughs> yeah, what's, Royal what's never this? give up pandering to the fucking star player. Apparently, that's the real story of RNG, <laughs> isn't it? To have the star, and he even plays fucking Lucian. Holy shit, the stories right themselves. <laughs> this is mental. It's like I feel like I've got through a fucking the looking glass or something. I was no one else amazed. This is a sick story. Yeah, no, I agree. It's it's really weird that we don't see more of these pursued or or even just interviews with the players. Like, what's Uzi doing right now? Just send a camera crew to his fucking house. Like, ask him to talk about this kind of stuff and the history of the team and play. You know, I, I, what's what's the relationship or what's the comparison between him then and Zhao Hu now? I think yes. it would be really interesting. But we never get the. I just feel like we never get these storylines at Worlds. There's never a sense of history. Like Worlds never gives me that sense of history. And for example, last year when it was supposed to be the 10 year anniversary that Nelson was talking about earlier, they were supposed to go, you know, totally all out. All we got in the finals was like a clip montage of the previous Worlds winners, and then they just used time to to put kind of bad KDA computer animations on stage instead of talking about the history of their own event. It's like they just wanted to, they just wanted some like really awkward K-pop with poorly animated sprites dancing around on a stage instead of us talking about the history of the, the eSport, which is what they were trying to celebrate. It's like, they just don't get it. <laughs> Fair though, they did make that really cool animated feature of Reckless battling everyone not at this year's Worlds. <laughs> I mean, I think that there's like, there has been a lot of content from the LPL side. I think it's just not translated. If I'm not wrong, there is like a doc there is a documentary for at least last year there was a documentary for every playoff team. Holy shit. That's yeah, but legit. It's, all in, okay. yeah, it's all in That's Chinese. Awesome. So. By the way, why also is every Western team not filming a fucking behind the scenes thing that you then choose how you edit afterwards, depending on the storyline and then releases a document. I don't get that again. Like you guys are willing to spend millions of dollars, but you won't just bring one guy with a camera filming everything. Well, get the fucking game cribs guy. Slasher got him fired due to the fucking edit anyway. I could probably fucking get you his number out. We could call him up. He's called Solly. He'll go around behind you and do all that shit. He needs the money. Just a pointless fucking stray bullet slasher catcher. There, that points up. Whatever. Everyone can get it nowadays. Where is slasher? Where'd he go? Peace and quiet at last on the timeline, eh, Monty? Who knew? Hey, indeed. Who indeed. knew? Exactly. <laughs> you know, they just, he just walked into the ocean, I guess. Who knows? Done, who knows what happened? Over. Who knows what I would do him, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish we had all those LPL features. It sounds like sounds they awesome. want to put together, you know, awesome historical content to, to contextualize what's going on at the world championship. Whereas I guess we just get nothing, just get nothing the last two years. Uh, very odd, very odd. All right. You want to talk about some of these other teams? I, sure. uh, do we, who, who else is getting it? Do you want to talk about T1? I think that's a sure. super interesting storyline because I touched on the fact that Faker, in spite of the aura, the glow that he has, um, has been, I think, an impactful player, but the team is really playing around the meta. And I think, you know, this has been true of Faker's entire career, right? Like he's taken a backseat at times when the meta, you know, he's just going to play Lulu, I guess. And it makes people, including myself, angry uh, because we want to see different things. But he's certainly not the same level of player that he once was in terms of dominance, because how the fuck could he be? That's like, you know, he was the peak League of Legends player ever. So holding him to that standard for the rest of his career is kind of unreasonable. Yeah, but um, even then, he's not even like, mate, all I'll, all I'll say is this, BDD's way better than Faker. You thought I'd ever say that fucking sentence out loud? Eh? I just said it. I said it. Before, that's an yeah. interesting one. That's a, that's an I'll interesting. Stand one. on that. Uh, here, here's the thing: is that Faker is playing a meta right now, and they're propping up Kana in the top lane, right? Uh, and it's it's working. It, it's absolutely working because if you actually look at some of the 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 stats from World so far, the top 
percentage damage players. The top three are all top laners. They're Nuguri, who was, I think, did Nuguri in, in some games? Yes. But he also won the game versus Cloud9. And I wouldn't say that his performance, I mean, we'll get to the Dade Award. Some people would say Nuguri is deserving of the Dade oh, Award. Weird. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> the criteria. We'll get to it later. But again, you notice they never even actually ask themselves what is the criteria they want. They just go, I think this guy was over it. So that, that was never what the award was. But we'll get to that. I'm getting triggered. We'll get to that later. That'll be, that'll be later. Uh, and the second uh, highest damage percentage was Khan. And the third is Kana. And normally you would say, okay, highest damage percentage on a team can be problematic because it shows that maybe other people are not exactly keeping up, right? With the Sapo team. one was an obvious example. It's like, mate, some of his play teammates never did anything in those games, did they? So, you know. Yeah. So, but if you if you think about the fact that two of these three players are on teams that are now probably favorites to win the tournament, like um, you know, you would say that potential, you know, T1 versus Dom one is a realistic that that matchup has a realistic chance of of being the best match in the entire tournament. Now, it's going to happen in the semifinals if it happens. Um, but these teams went a combined, what, 11 and one in the group stage. And so when you look at that and you look at the damage percentage, you're saying, OK, they are actively choosing to play through the top lane. And the choice of top lane carries is, in fact, working right kana has played two games of graves two great games of jason two games of kennan these are the champions they want to go for they're very meta picks right now and faker on the other hand has played three games of tf one of azir one zoe one oriana so he's mostly played a more supportive role and faker's damage percentage is among the lowest of all mid laners he's second lowest right but the difference is is that he's also not taking any of the gold um so if I'm looking, hold on, let me look at my the mid lane stats. Faker is second lowest at 20% of the damage, but his gold is the lowest at 20% of the gold. So he's actually not taking much of the resources and giving them over to Kana and Gumayushi mostly. And then that's resulting in Kana especially carrying these games. So right now, I think that, as I said earlier, T1 is playing an FPX style. This is like the quintessential FPX style that we saw in 2019. And I expected to see at this world championship as well. And unfortunately we didn't get it, but it just goes to show that it is effective, at least for the time being. The difference is that when you have Faker and the difference compared to like, let's say RNG is that Faker can definitely play LeBlanc, right? <laughs> That's not even really a question. Um, and so when you look at how RNG is playing, you just see that, okay, they're winning because they're playing this meta style, but they can they can definitely do other things. Whereas I'm very suspicious that in a best of five, if push comes to shove, that Kryon's going to come here and have like a crazy breakout performance. And the thing is, Faker in high pressure situations tends to deliver, tends to deliver. So he has a clutch factor that you know is is just kind of lurking behind there. But the team itself right now, is playing around this meta and Faker is not having an ego about how he's playing. He's just going to do what it takes to win. Um, so T1 looks super good. They've been really good in the early game. Um, you know, Faker doesn't have, he hasn't had a huge, he hasn't had a huge statistical impact, but if you, the eye test says that he's generally been in the right places, doing the right things, doing his job and allowing other people to carry. You always have one of the freest fucking quarterfinals draws you'll ever see in a bloody world championship. Well, well, here's here's a here's a comparison, Thorn. What's so interesting about this matchup is the Chovy versus Faker matchup because they're opposite. Chovy is taking the most gold out of any mid laner at this tournament, and Faker's taking the least. Right, so the resource allocation is just completely reversed for Hanwha, which. I mean, they have fucking Morgan. Like, this is a good plan for Hanwha, but it also shows that they're they're fighting an uphill battle against the meta that I just don't think is is tenable. Like, it is really free for T one. It's the thing. Point one thing. No, no, people will point at this and they'll say, "Well, look at the look at you know the summer and the gauntlet and like those were close matches between T one and Hanwha in a different meta, guys. In a different meta, Hanwha's read on this meta is it's not good. And like this this was the worst possible meta probably for Hanwha." To come into this world championship with having to rely on Morgan and Willer, like that's bad. So, 
Here's the thing, right? There are two Morgans. And the problem is you mainly see the first Morgan. You see Morgan Freeman because he is a fucking free lane and he's just garbage. He's just fucking absolute con. The other one, if he gets his shit together and wins worlds and leads everyone in the world, it'll be Morgan Stanley, financial global leader in financial services. So Paul <laughs> Gold Toplin, there you go. <laughs> Listen, Nelson, you don't get this kind of material elsewhere. Fucking hotline league could be running for 700 years and never get this shit there. I'm coming up with it on the fly. <laughs> You like that? But, Take that one on with you. See, the, the difference, the difference is, is that no, you know, Morgan Freeman, everyone appreciates whenever he's on film. However, Morgan from Hanwha, I never appreciate seeing him on film. So uh, my 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 level of enjoyment is certainly a hell of a lot lower in the Morgan League of Legends. <laughs> I, I mean, he got he was kicked he was kicked from World Elite and just went to Korea and won. So, I mean, that's all I had to say, right? There you go. No problem. Yep. But I mean, like like your previous point about RNG, I think I think it depends, right? Like you said, when push comes to shove, but it depends what that means. It depends on drafts, I think, because the way RNG draft, I think it's very clear that they don't care what's happening in the lane. As long as he can join, as long as Crying can join the fight, yes. it's fine. Which is why they play champions, you know, TF, Galio, LeBlanc, where they either want to flank or they have like a global. So actually his lane doesn't matter. Which is actually, which is, let's be real, like compared to most other teams in this tournament, it's a very unique way to play. Probably the yeah. most unique, right? Like, I don't know, dude, I don't know if anyone could play the way RNG is. Feels like and they're just, no. they've just got a completely unique way of playing the game right now. And I think, like, if you look at the stats, right, like the damage, like Xiaohu is one of the highest, like, DPM amongst all players, and Gala is above him, but they are still playing to his top side. It's like, it's, I think it's just, they are using the resources very well, where they use they snowball topside early, and then they give and they allocate the CS to Gala later on. Oh yeah, Khan and Kana are both above Xiaohu, though. That's that's like what I find so so interesting about some of you know these conversations is like if the theory of RNG is that they're going to sacrifice Kryon in order to prop up Xiaohu, they're just doing it worse than other teams are, are currently doing it. Even though they, I would say they have a more flexible champion pool and comp selection out of top lane because of Xiaohu's champ pool. Um, I think that other teams are more limited, but the, the counter of that is that RNG is very limited in the mid lane in, in ways that other teams are not. So I think it's, I think it's an interesting stylistic point, but I'm just not sure that's going to be enough to like win worlds you know what i yeah, mean I, I i think it depends how the meta evolves right like like what do people play if tf is banned if it's like me if it's like Aurelia or yasso then i think they are gonna have a rough time but if it's back to majors i think it's fine because crying yeah. before he was on rng he was just known to be uh like people used to call him like uh the uh a turret you know like you can't break him when he's playing majors like azir oriana so here's a here's a question for you in terms of bans, um, now Twisted Fate has had, right now, out of the 51 games that have happened, Twisted Fate has been picked in almost all of them. So 94.4%. He's been banned 28 times, but he's been picked 23 times, which means that in terms of ban priority, Yumi's number one right now, then Aurelia, then Lucian, then LeBlanc, then Lee Sin. So there are five champs that are being banned more than TF. Do you think this is going to change during the the best of five, like during playoffs? Because I have to imagine that TF is going to go into almost like the the ban rate's going to go up on TF and it's going to go down on Yumi pretty significantly. I think the the ban rate on like you know Lucian, Lee Sin, and LeBlanc should be going down. There are champions you can play. You know you can play the Poppy. You can play. I mean it depends what you want to play against uh, LeBlanc. You can play like Azir. Depending on your comp as well, whether you have lockdown, you know, you can play like Poppy into Lee Sin. The other AD junglers have okay matchups into Lee Sin as well. Uh, but I think TF should be, and is going to be permaban, is probably the hardest champion to play against. And it's like the only champion which like everyone can play well, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's not very mechanically demanding, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's not. It turns out it's not hard to hit Everfrost if you have a gold card that is literally point and click with, you know, like as long as you you stay under your turret and you hear what your teammates <laughs> are saying, you're like doing your job. 
I'm I'm actually surprised that the the ban rate wasn't higher, especially because, like you say, I I see a lot more ways to deal with certain other champions like Yumi, LeBlanc, Lee Sin, Lucian, like you're saying, than I do with the TF. The TF is just incredibly annoying. Um, so I I anticipate that that ban rate is going to go through the roof. I think Yumi it depends, right? Yeah, like Yumi, you can use like Lulu or Soraka, but not every team is comfortable with ring supports, so it could still be banned. I think over time we're going to see, especially in a best of five, I think letting Yumi through is more acceptable. Best of ones, I think you're kind of worried about her just randomly popping off. I was talking t with Dom about this, um, and uh, yeah, he 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 agreed that the the Yumi the Yumi level would probably go down over time uh, in the best mm -hmm. of fives, but we'll see. We also just do a need to see a way better RNG in the playoffs. Like, obviously, they have a sleeper chance of making the final. Maybe they can even be a champion if they get the right sort of, like, meta read. But I have to say, in the group stage, they fucking limped through this group. This group was, in theory, <laughs> once Fnatic didn't have upset, yep. this group was one. It should have been one of the most easy groups imaginable. They made it look hard work against every fucking team. And they always start slow, right? I, I, I think every playoff, they start very slow, and they ramp up over time. So I think we have to see. All right. Do we want to talk about any of the, the other? Nine? How about that, yeah. eh? I... How about the team that all year long everyone's been hating on? And then as I, was, I basically alluded to, this is going to be the greatest group stage escape in the history of League of Legends. There was supposed to be no chance of doing it. And then add that in. That's a normal like start at the beginning of the group stage. Once you go to the end of week one, if I had to calculate odds, I'm going to say the odds are what, like 1% that you get out of the group in that fashion. That's fucking mental. Everyone yeah, wrote I, this I whole thought, team off. I, I thought after week one, it was kind of rough. Doomed? <laughs> yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was doomed for them, right? I think. Yeah, and then fucking Perks came along. He was like, oh, what's that, Doinby? You think you're the protagonist? Hold these fucking nuts, son. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't. I don't think it was perks. I think it was a uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, Why but you I think. It to him, then? Why are you giving it but, to him? But, then? but for the next few games, yeah, for sure, right? I think I'm not sure what they're doing. Like for oh, sure, think... that LeBlanc game though. Oh, yeah, prime perks. That was classic. But, that was vintage, motherfucker. It's like I went back I, in time to season eight. I think the game against uh, Dam One and against Rogue, he was doing his best to like one v nine the game. I guess I think against Dam One, it was just too bad that you know he was playing TF against Cassidy, and his teammates couldn't like pull their weight. But against Rogue, I think it was like a, I think it was just like perks against, perks against the world. I think it was just insane. Where it's been the whole time, perks against the world. The difference is he wins quite a few of those <laughs> against the world. <laughs> you know, not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think with Cloud9, like I said earlier, we've seen the upside to this team and some of their victories at MSI. We've seen the downside as well. Um, but the demons they're fighting are all internal. They're not they're not losing really to other people. They're losing to their own mistakes a lot of the time. And sometimes those mistakes come in like really dumb early game fights. Sometimes they come in, you know, Perks lost some games, like when he's just out there oh, split pushing on Rise. Couple. Yeah, ridiculously, like in the first round Robin. Um you know, it takes the thing about perks, though, is it takes him. He has to in multiple times to lose the game. It's not like yes. his decisions result in instant loss most of the time. It's that they result in gradual disadvantages until you lose, um, yes. which is what we saw in the, the tiebreaker game as well, is that he made some questionable plays. But in the end, he also made the game winning play. So it's like the, the decisions he makes will not lose you the game, but they can maybe win you the game uh, at the same time. Um, and then when they're question. at so, you know, Monty traditionally, Nelson, was a Doin B hater before he like leveled up his laning phase and actually started to play the meta champions, right? Was this not Monty, the game that um, Cloud9 played against FPX? Was this not just like Doin B did a vintage Doin B? Rumble pick mid, just proceed to do fuck <laughs> all in the game. It was mental, wasn't it? It was like, it was like we were back three years as well, wasn't it? Like, what the fuck? This was like some prime Messiah fucking whatever it was. He, what was it? He played mid. Scion, there we go. This was like Dude, some old school shit, son. Dude, I, this, it, it was like they were trying to roll back the clock on League of Legends because it wasn't just know. the Rumble. It was like the, it was the Rumble Jarvan Graves conversation 
combination, which is Amazing. like the hot pot where you like Jarvan ult and then you put the rumble ult in there yeah. and then you shoot the graves ult across the top of it, which was a lot better when the meta, when players weren't as good at playing around cooldowns as they are right now. And so I just feel like these ult combos are so garbage in the current meta because you'll see one and you'll be like, wow, that was, that was incredible. And to be fair, FBX did kind of win by using these combos. You know, remember like Kiana rumble ults that were so key to their, like their victory in 2019. Um, but now teams are so good at exploiting smaller windows of opportunity that it becomes a lot more difficult, I think, to play these style of compositions over time. Um, so I, I was just kind of, I was disappointed with the theory of this game coming from FBX because I think, I think that's when you know that they were really uncomfortable because they were trying to do something from such a long time ago um, on the international stage. I found it odd. What did you think, sure. Nelson? Do you enjoy this draft? <laughs> I mean, I think it was a pretty bad draft because... I think the only reason why they played like these this com is because of I think limitation of the jungler. If you notice, Tian can only play AD junglers. He can't play any AP junglers at all, or it's not very good. Um, Doing B, for even though he can play like so many champions, he has to accommodate accommodate with his jungle pick. And I think Rumbo, it was not a very good throwback because. Rumble is one of the champions. I think it's a signature Doin B champion where you don't have to lane. You just run around with Predator and try and dive side lanes. But at the end, also, it was a bad draft to pick like Jumbo, uh, Jarvan, and Rumble. Especially when you're playing against like, you know, Tristana, Rakan, TF. I think it's, it's very hard. But I mean, like throwing everything on TF, it doesn't matter, anyways. And you can't even make the NA just. Joke, he's not even fucking from any. Some new other <laughs> part of the world, and he's from as far from any as you can get. It's like twenty-seven hours to get there. <laughs> to be fair, it's uh, Australia's closer to NA than it is to Europe. <laughs> okay, don't oh. Just stay where you are. Stay in your prison. You know. Well, Speaking they... of vintage performances, back to being a prison. Cool. <laughs> obviously nelson can't say anything about any of those topics it's all right you know, <laughs> yeah, let it go just let it go by don't worry about any of it it's all good back, back, to back to video games exactly back to video games <laughs> uh yeah I, I i don't know i i was impressed by by c9 and um i think what's interesting to discuss is that they have a pretty legit shot of beating gen g of all the teams they could have gotten mate i'm not surprised they were cheering that was the one that's the one oh, you yeah, want of course I, I mean, Perk's, Perk's body yeah. Gen G last year. <laughs> it's the uh, same roster. It's and the you same just go roster. The team. I'll go down, right? Think of the team, right? Just man for man. So Birdall, I, do, I actually don't know. As Rascal fucked everyone's fucking girlfriend in Gen G. Or something. He came back. He came back. And then the last played day. one champion and everyone is fully aware of that. So he doesn't get to play that one champion. I don't know why he's playing, right? That one doesn't even make sense to me. I thought that was gambling to even use that guy. But again, I assume in scrims it worked out and blah, blah, blah. It was all good, right? So you're telling me Fudge can't win some lanes if Birdall's in the game. Fuck it. If Rascal's in the game, he has a chance. Then you go junglers. Actually cleared, I thought, in the second round rotation of the round robin. Look, that you had some pretty good games, some kind of flashbacks. Blabber can have the odd pop off. You just hope it. I don't care about the pop I just hope he doesn't hint the game away. That's my problem. It's the liability issue. Perks obviously is not as strong as BDD as a raw player right now, but he has the clutch factor. And then the bot lane, like obviously, I'll give that over to the guys from Gen G. But even then, I thought this is an interesting angle on Gen G. Basically, I went down the players, but then when I got to Ruler, I said, in, even though in theory you'd give the edge to the Gen G bot lane, I actually don't even feel like they've played around Ruler very well. Like it doesn't feel like he's been mega impactful in this tournament. He had a couple of games that were pretty good. Yeah, for sure. But I think I think all the Korean teams there, uh, most of them they have the same issue, except Hanwha, where they want to follow, they want to imitate the best team. So probably like they want to imitate SKT and or they want to Im imitate Damwon. But I don't feel like Gen G has the have the players to do so and and even though Fudge has been kind of weak in the laning phase but i think in mid late game he has been fine this roast but i don't think any of the genji top laners can punish him for that yeah i i think if, if you look at genji first off you have to consider their typical performances in best of fives second off you have to consider that perks actually has had success 
playing against this team in the past and and does know their tendencies more or less. You look at the player matchups and you wonder, is this is this really punishable uh, by by Gen G? And the problem with Gen G as a team is that they don't snowball advantages very well. Um, if you if you look at where they've been in this tournament, like they frequently have leads like. They have a, they're what, the fifth best team in terms of goal differential at 15 minutes. Um, they get first blood in 75% of their games. They get first tower in 75% of their games. They, they've they gotten first the first three towers in 63% of their games. They are the third team in terms of plates per game. Um, you get these to the all... mid game and it's always up in the air, isn't it? It's always up in the fucking air. <laughs> so, so the, problem, the problem that I see with Gen G <laughs> is that, so the weird thing about Gen G is people are like, oh yeah, they're a late game team. No, they're not. The problem is, is that they actually have been getting early game advantages that they just fail to convert. They're actually terrible at taking leads and expanding them. And then they go into these games and they just coin flip them. They coin flip them late. Like there's a reason this team was three and three in spite of these statistics. Yes. You should be able to convert these edges. Other teams are converting the advantages that they get. And so in a world where Cloud9 has a bad early game, they're still going to be in it late. Look, Mad Lions was very close to beating Gen G. Yes. Despite having, you know, not not a great early game, but if you pick scaling compositions, you always got a shot against Gen G, I feel like. So I, I actually, I think Cloud9 can do this. It's Is it going to take a good, there's a world where they go 03 versus Gen G. Like, oh, let's be honest. Yeah, they could that, be shit. That, that definitely exists. <laughs> there's also a world where they go 3-0 over Gen G. But like, it this is it. I'll tell you where I am. I actually submitted my predictions today to the sponsor I work with. Obviously, they don't sponsor this show, so I won't reference them. And basically, they asked me, like, who's going to win all these games? Because I don't give a fuck. I'll even give the game score. So I said for this particular matchup, and I don't care if people think this is hopium, I said Gen G wins, but they win 3-2. Like, I normally don't ever do 3-2 predictions because normally I think it's a cop-out. I think this one, like you're saying, has every possible result. Gen G can flop completely and get swept Cloud9 can flop and get swept. They could also just play an epic back and forth fa full five game series. Who the fuck knows who wins? Because the crazy thing is, as you said, not only could Gen G, by the way, have won games they lost in this group stage, they almost lost like two of the games they won. It was ridiculous. Like, it was actually, I actually thought the team it basically. I think they should have lost to Mad Lions. <laughs> they probably should have. Yeah, it probably should have been second. And by the way, here's what's sick. This actually makes me want to puke. Logically, if Mad Lions had won the tiebreaker, this would be Mad Lions versus Cloud9 right now. Do you have oh, any yeah. idea how hype that would be? That would be fucking insane. But if it isn't, of course, so never mind. I, As I'm usual, sure. we also, all, all the hypotheticals are the cool ones for Worlds. Not the reality is like, oh, well. Instead, we just, we, we, we spend a whole year not getting a best of five between NA and EU. A whole year. I mean, if there's, Why do I if live there, in this world? If there are in any games where there's like not a lot of stakes, I think Genji should win. But I, I never liked this iteration of the roster with BDD and Clit, I don't... They get clapped I, in every best of five they've played. They get yeah, clapped. I, I don't think they are very good. But if I had to put money on something, I would even pick like Vitality to beat them, you know? If it's like a final. Because I just don't think they're very good. They always play the same way, kind of choke, make many mechanical mistakes in team fights when the games really matter. And I, I, I think C9 has a yeah, great chance to beat them. I will say I think BDD is is having an exceptional performance. That he's overperforming a lot, which makes me slightly more confident in Gen G than I would have been otherwise. I mean, his game on Zoe was I incredible. Um, oh, Shampoo just... looks legit as well, too, doesn't it? Yeah. So, uh, but I still don't think that's. I, I think I think C nine is going to win this, uh, given the historic failures of Gen G, given the perks factor, and the fact that he played this exact same roster last year. Um, given Cloud 9s performance, that I think they can carry over from the second day. I think I think Cloud Nine. I think this is very winnable for them. Yeah, I, I think it's winnable. But of course, right? If if Gen G just plays stuff like you know, Renekton to cover up you know the weakness of his laning, and just for early early game top side. And the game matters a lot on jungle and support moving around the map. I think D9 might have a harder time because, I mean, I think Blabber is playing well, but I, I think Vulcan has been very, very bad in this world so far.
Here's what you have to Fair. understand, Nelson. If C9 pulls it off and beats Gen G, then, because spoiler, obviously Dan One beats Mad Lions. Here's what's going to happen. The semi-finals, my dream, listen, I think EDG will actually beat RNG, but in a world where RNG pulls off the upset, this is the most hype match maybe ever at Worlds, minus when fucking uh, G2 was in the final against FBX. And here's why. Because do you have any idea the spirit bomb that is going to be made around perks in the semi-finals of a potentially upset winnable match? Everyone from NA... Oh, the hype. Everyone from EU. Oh, the goat, the goat. Like, at that point in time, like, the hype is going to be insane. It'd be through the fucking roof, wouldn't it? It'd be amazing. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a question for you, Nelson, because... Oh, and also, know, as Monty said earlier, in light of Perks' record in semis, if he just goes four semis in a row at Worlds and with two different teams and with two fuck and with a role swap... He can just tell everyone to suck his dick at that point in time. Like, <laughs> dick can make as many threads as they want. Like, you can all just fuck right off. By the way, in case you don't know, people like Faker haven't done that. Like, I don't think anyone's done it in league history, you know. Get out of my Not face. with a roll swap. Of course I mean, not. Of yeah. course not. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had a question for you about what the Chinese community calls players, because one thing that Thorin and I have been harping on across esports is that we need more nicknames. And like, I, I love the idea of Perks being the main character because he, he seems to just have like invincible plot armor. Yes. Some people are like the protagonist, but he's kind of an antagonist sometimes. So I don't think that's, you know, he's kind of a villain at, at points in time. So I don't think that's as appropriate as the main character, but it does feel like he just, he just wins. Like it, it, he does feel. I, I would just call, if I had to pick a, a nickname, I would just call him the talisman. <laughs> that's a good one. That's, what, that's why I, I say, mean, dude, he's like that as a player. If you have this guy in your team, the crazy thing is it, it's obvious that he doesn't, it's like the old Doinby. He obviously isn't doing it all literally himself, but the effect he has on the other players is mental. Like somehow players just do shit and have games that they just don't have when he's not there. I think like the Chinese nicknames for foreign players, most um, of them are very boring. Oh, it's not any good ones. No, 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 no. Yeah, I don't care about the foreign players. Like, I care about... Like, tell us some of the cool ones. What are the best that, Chinese that ones? Mm. Okay, I mean, like, not all of them are, like, good. But, but for, What's for, the best for, one? For example, like, for, for Flandre, he was known as, like... Uh, his nickname, at least in Chinese, was, like, Lucian, because he used to be, like, Lucian One Trick. That's and garbage. Mo yeah, yeah, I mean... More than that, give us a good one. Come well, on, they got to have some cool ones. What do they call Xiaohu? Oh, I mean, right now, right now he's just like the, him and Ming is like the, he's like the father of the orphanage, you know? Right, yeah, that, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one, that's legit. Father yeah. of the orphanage, yeah. Okay. It's good. And it's like, usually of the, for the foreign players, it's like, for per, for example, Perks, they just, call, they just call him like Emperor Perks, or like King Perks. All right. At least they understand respect and like the yeah. kids on nephews on Reddit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Emperor Perks. Now, that's even why I even had a joke like that where I called him Emperor Perks. Because, you know, there was like a thing where they were just going like, like basically Perks was saying like Europe did win or whatever. And it's like, that's just like that scene at the end of the fucking prequels where he's like, I am the Senate. That's what Perks is like. Like each dizzy you as well. And just, <laughs> no one can talk shit to him. I think he's dizzy you. Isn't he? Just bow down. I, I like how the Chinese fans, it's in spite of like, you know, literally beating perks in a, in a world finals are more respectful to perks from the tsm fans yeah. who are like yeah sword art is a better investment yeah for sure right because i mean <laughs> he he was the first one to beat like the korean teams even before yes or i mean everyone knows everyone felt that he helped the korea the chinese teams to win right there you go he was a secret double agent exactly yeah, yeah. exactly right. <laughs> and i, I remember like you know, Baolan, Baolan was. I mean, I might get flamed for this, but everyone, everyone just called him like princess, little princess. That one makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for for Ning is like the king of sneakers, like shoes, king of shoes. Because right, okay. he just like to spend money on shoes. Just, I thought it was because he's just running, running it down the whole fucking that time. <laughs> <Well done>. <laughs> 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 like that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's the way that started so cool. King of sneakers. I'm thinking, right, Morty, what's the metaphor here? Where's he go? And he goes, because he just like to buy sneakers. Like, no. <laughs> right, I apologize. We overvalued the skill of the Chinese scene at making nicknames. Apparently, it was all just Koreans and Brood War the whole time. No, there must be some good ones, though. Like, what's like a really. Well, let me think. Let me ask you. What about. What do they call Viper? I think they don't have anything yet. 
What the fuck? He's even named after a snake. There's about a million angles. You can go on that one. Come on. Come on. Get, get on it, China. Get your fucking shit together. What about uh, Tarzan? Does he have a good nickname? Uh, I mean, this is just pretty bad. They just call him like King of the Jungle. No, that's <laughs> fucking trying. You know, that's some <laughs> level shit, motherfucker. I don't know. What are you doing? What are you doing? He gave you. Not making Fion look like the most talented motherfucker in the history of esports right now. Uh, uh, see, uh, most of them are just like very basic, but uh, I think well, at least in nah. Chinese, in Chinese there's like some like innuendo or some hidden me- meaning in the in the names at least. But I always thought Korea has had some of the best. Like, dude, even the aforementioned Dade, King of Spring. What a fucking sick yep. nickname that is. By the way, should we just go ahead and say it since we sort of finished talking about FPX? This is what the Dade Award is, nephews. Sit down while I explain. The premise is Dade was one of the best players in the world and a champion. And he went to Worlds and his team on paper should have been like a semi-finalist, maybe had a chance to even win the tournament as a dark horse. And they didn't even get out of groups and he absolutely shit the bed. He completely fell apart in every possible context. And it was terrible so we made this award the Dade award and it's meant to be this you're supposed to be incredibly hyped as one of the best players in the world or in the game you could even say relative region but we typically mean the world and at worlds itself you don't just play okay so for example idiots last year like knight should win the award no he just played okay or good it's that you utterly flail you flop so hard that it reminds us of Dade. so as you said monty people going what about nagori it's like did you not see where his own team's subbed him in the fucking summer and he was having some mad ropey games it has to be doing be P- people i respect and by the way it was a legit take like like peter don had him the number one player in the world legit take. so it's not like well, he wasn't the worst in every game no that's not the criteria the point is if you're the number one player in the world in a group that's supposed to be impossible to fail to get out of you're supposed to carry you're supposed to pop off you're not supposed to pick rumble yeah you also you well you also have to have like kind of failures on your on your your signature picks too, like yes. Dade completely like ran it in the 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 tiebreaker versus Gambit on Twisted Fate. And by the way, he was probably the best Twisted Fate player yes. in the world in 2014, like the next year. So you know this Messiah, maybe you know there you could make an argument. Anyway, very good player uh, on many of these picks, and he was completely just sucking. And so when you see mid Rumble, of course you're going to think, wow, that's a doing be pick. That's that's a classic right there, awesome. and. Super, super underwhelming performance on his signature picks. And people expect it. If you guys watch some of his games, like some of his Oriana performances were incredible this year in, in LPL. And he was carrying this team and he was making very good mechanical plays. And so the expectation of this guy of uh, uh, the storyline was also very good coming in because nobody thought he was the best mid laner when he won the world championship. Yep. But people thought coming into this tournament that he might be the best mid laner sure. at this tournament. He was certainly in the conversation. Um, and so this is what the Dade award is guys. And it doesn't have to be given out every year. Cause not, you know, it's yes. rare to see a flop of this capacity. Yes. Um, but it was, you know, was he the worst player on his team? No, he was not the worst player on his team. Was he the worst player relative to his own expectation and performance? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, he was. And it's just, just, just nice that a Korean mid laner wins again. You know, bring it full circle. We're right back. <laughs> We're right back again. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Like what was the what was the Chinese community's expectation of of Doen B? Did they did they hold him in this lofty regard that we saw? You know, many of the Western analysts. I think from from what I yeah for sure, but I think from what I see on like the message boards and community is basically the community have been blaming like the import players of for like not performing on stage, and I, I think it's kind of true, right? Like the Korean players who got knocked out, they didn't perform. When it mattered, especially on week two, right? Because I remember, like, even LNG, like Tarzan was smurfing on week one, and week two he was invisible. And Boeing and Nogri were fine week one, like, okay, I guess. You could say, you know, they carried against C9, but on second week they just second week they just disappeared. By the way, I love what they did there, Monty. I'll give you a quick analogy. If you don't know, right, famously in men's tennis, there was an insane stat where even though tennis, I'm going to guess, was invented in England because of like, the history of the game and Wimbledon and stuff, famous, basically no man had won a Grand Slam in tennis since Fred Perry in something mental like the 20s or something insane, right? So it was some absurdly long period of time and there's all these players came along where they'd be top 10 or they could make the semis of Wimbledon but they could never win the Grand Slam, right? And then Andy Murray came 
along and he was making all these finals, but he kept losing, right? So the joke is, and this is real, the newspapers used to literally refer to him when he would lose in the finals, Monty, as Scotland's Andy Murray. But then when he won the Grand Slam, <laughs> they said the United Kingdom or Great Britain, Andy Murray, because that's what twats the media are, right? Well, the joke here is, all I've heard for the last three years is like, Toynbee's basically Chinese now. He's got, he's getting like, you know, his papers. He's no longer counted as an import by the LPL. He's married and everything. And then the second he loses, they're like, of course, that Korean middling. I'm not really a fan. Like, what the fuck is this? What is this? Dude, he brought you guys worlds. What are you doing? What is this? <laughs> Even they're doing it. Dude. We normally do it to mock them. Like, you carried by chat. Koreans are like, no, we're bloody kept down by Koreans. Like, what is this thing? <laughs> this is madness. What? Uh, here's my joke. And listen, if anyone Chinese is watching, first of all, just level up your sense of humor. And two, it's just a joke. It's not a real comment. So, you know, everyone just kept crowbarring that narrative the whole time of like, he won because of the wife buff. Yeah, but here's the problem. That didn't work, did it? So logically, he needs to get married again. Oof. Just logically, you're the ones who made it a storyline. I didn't make it real. If magic's real, then use it. I'm just saying. Just saying that one gets worn out. You know, the buff wears off after a while, like a real buff. You know, you've got to get another just one. Needs to renew his vows. Maybe he just needs to Could have also do know, that. Two, yeah. two weddings a year. Yeah. And also within those vows, when you renew them, just say you won't ever play Rumble again or Galio. I don't want to see those classic picks. I want the like, new school down me, not the old one. Get the old one back. Like like I I know there's a meme in the like Chinese community where they say like if you win, if you win worlds, or if you win, you're the king. But if you lose you're also the king, but you're the king of Twitter because every time teams lose, they're gonna write a long, long essay on why they lost and apologize. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. <laughs> like even Chinese so, teams do the same. I I just think you know I I I had hoped that the Chinese community would have better nicknames, but I think that you know this is a tradition that we really need to bring back to esports because honestly, it's it's one of the best ways to encapsulate narratives right and really drive people's excitement and the way that they perceive the game and it creates this uh really fun symbolism that you can really drive a lot of meaning and hype and, and entertainment out of and it's kind of lost it's like you know it's like in brood war they had all of these fucking insane names for people um like brood war is probably the best at it but it was probably also the best games in in terms of narratives like you had the six dragons which were like the best protoss players and so they had this alternative identity right or you had savior being called the maestro because of how well he was you know his like orchestrating of these games um just really great shit like do you have any favorites from the the brood war era thorin Probably the craziest ones were the ones where, like, the player literally, like, developed into that. So what's crazy is, if people don't know, the nickname that they had in the middle period of Flash, the ultimate weapon, was actually before he won all the championships. It's when he'd won, like, a couple of times. And they just meant that because at the time, KTF, the team he played for, he was, like, the ultimate weapon for them, I think, in Pro League or something. But essentially, that's one of those ones where, like, you almost become what your name is. You manifest it. Because by the end of the game, he was the ultimate weapon. Like, he could win every single Pro, every single matchup with, like, an absurd win rate he'd mastered all styles of the game cheesing and macro he was just basically like a perfect player so yeah brood had some amazing ones i also i always thought the one for jadon was amazing the tyrant because when he was the most dominant player he would not only yeah. be clutch but he would just smash you he would like just destroy all hope that he had. So that was a brilliant one as well let me think what's another good one uh i mean the original one for box is obviously a classic emperor of terran that's a great one also, I just, I've told this story before, but there's a lot of Zoomers here, so they won't know it. There's just an old school story I've always loved because it's just an example of how when you translate, don't translate literally, translate essentially they like they're, what their spirit of what they're trying to say because otherwise you'll scoff it. So I remember reading this interview with Boxer, one of the first great Korean champions in Brood War, and they asked him, they said, what do you, Muhammad Ali, and Michael Jordan all have in common? And then he answered, we have all been given the title Emperor. Now, listen, I don't know what they actually meant by that if without the translation, but I laughed for about half an hour when I read that. Like, I, I must have missed Emperor Muhammad Ali, but all right, I guess. Uh, <laughs> listen, I, I get what you mean, but that you've scuffed that so badly in the translation. You made it hilarious, unintentionally. Yeah, I, and, you know, when, when I was casting in Korea, 
uh, Doa and I had these conversations about how to create narratives around players and what had happened in Korean history around these Brood War players. So we did that, you know, we were the ones who came up with the immortal score, which was a great definition of scores play style as an AD carry because he wouldn't die. Right. And it, in, when you hear the immortal score in some of these, in some of these games, it really sticks with you. And so you, you know, you feel like, you know, more about that player and you have this storyline and expectation coming in. It's like when we call Dandy, the Prince of Thieves as well, because he was stealing all of the buffs or stealing all of the objectives. And it becomes part, it becomes something that people latch onto. And it really just isn't done anymore like the fact that perks doesn't have a nickname right now is fucking crazy it's it's actually crazy that this player doesn't actually doesn't have this kind of identity or some of these legacy players like bjergsen or if he comes back or jensen right now um there's just so much that can be done it's just left by the wayside nobody nobody does it but i think i think we really need to to bring that back within the context of of esports and sometimes it's more meme like i guess you have like the the, the claps and craps for for caps which is like kind of funny but it doesn't it doesn't you can come up with something better to describe him as a player that really becomes like a core part of his identity that is more epic i think or or more meaningful so i i, I just want to see it i just want to see more of it out there i hope the the community uh, or like the casters actually roll with it because it's something that i think has been lost in terms of esports, and it's something that was done so well in Brood War that it's a shame that we don't have more of it today. I, I can already imagine what Thorin is thinking about. Wow. You just call, you just call like the immortal, immortal reckless. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> there you go. The joke, you know, the joke is like you know, there's a really great quote by Michael Jordan. It's one of the best quotes of all time. But I could take the same quote, and if I put it in Reckless's mouth, it makes it look ridiculous. So the quote is this, right? Because it's about a winner's mindset, Nelson, and the idea that like you'll never give up. Michael Jordan said, "I've never lost a game of basketball. I just ran out of time." Now that sounds amazing. If Michael Jordan says it, if Reckless says it, it actually just accurately describes how he probably does think the game works. I mean, I would, I would just call ah. him the clean. I would call him the Kleenex King because when he loses, he needs a box, and his play style is so masturbatory. So there you go, works two ways. He needs Kleenex. So do his fans, for either reason. For either reason, exactly. Yeah, and also his entire style is just cleaning up after other people. Oh, you've made a mess. Well, I'll just clean up then. All right. Uh, I think, like, just to clarify, I think if. For most coaches who have had him on on a, on a on a team before, I think. Oh, I bet he's wonderful, isn't he? Go on, fucking yeah. tell us. He he's just someone which I think it's good because you don't have to care about his play because he basically he doesn't make mistakes, but that's about it. I Except think for his entire philosophy on the game, but yes, I forgot you're right. I, I mean, he he doesn't really make he doesn't really make mistakes which will lose you the game. That's a brilliant thing to say, Nelson. Except for this. All the greatest players yeah. in history are willing to make mistakes to win the game. He isn't. Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? But I think not, I'm not hating. They, That's the legit. That, yeah. If you're looking history, what what put it this way? What boring player ever was the best in the world? Has right, that think, happened? I think you're right, but I think in comparison with Western eighties, who are like perma dying mid lane. Oh, of course, we have got some terrible ones. I know. Uh, almost all of them just die mid lane. Yeah, I think Re Reckless is like the only one which I've seen like never die mid lane, which is. Mind blowing to me when I watched the games as well. Look, unfortunately, the timing ain't great because we never got a chance to test this out. But all I'm saying is, give my boy upset two more years and we'll have a different conversation. Two more, and yeah, that's right. He gets uh, that Halo Sound for uh, a few so, years. You dad fox. Two uh, I think for years. upset is upset is different. Upset doesn't die mid lane because his whole team is behind anyway. So yeah, <laughs> too busy one v nine in. Yeah, okay, let's talk about Fnatic then. We have to. Well, we, we do have to have a conversation about. Uh, look, was their performance? I think. Was okay. Cares about the considering we all care about the weep longer. Because oh. <laughs> right. here's the king of Twitter. The king of Twitter is fucking weep or me. Anytime he writes a twit longer, I'm just waiting. Like right, Uzi sold up the river on this one. So it was me and Dom before. It was what like fucking everyone, mate. This guy's unreal when he goes to twit longer. Someone get this. Listen, of all the people in history, I am aware that I'm saying this with self awareness. Someone get this motherfucker off Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's the thing, though. All you fans who go, Yo, that applies to you. I'm trying to manually unsubscribe all of you from my Twitter. I'm trying to do you a favor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think right now you can make someone unfollow you. So 
<laughs> Here's the problem. Do you want to know what, Nelson? Yep. People are going to think, oh, so Thorin, will you switch to that and make me unfollow you? Nah, it's all just going to block you. It's funny. It's just funnier, isn't it? I like the max. People don't get this. I like disrespect. I like to give people maximum disrespect. Yes, that's right. That's what I do. So- Let's let's talk about this twit logger because this is definitely one of like the wildest takes oh, I have I've ever seen. Which is why is it, by the way, Monty? Yeah. In a world where video interviews exist, simple tweets themselves exist, why is it that something about the medium of twit longer produces the most embarrassing and cringy <laughs> shit in the history of any esport game? By the way, we had some in Counter Strike that were unbelievable. We had one where basically a guy was like, "You guys don't understand. I play the most despicable positions," and he was talking about Counter Strike, and we were like, "What? What are you talking?" Like, essentially, it's always the phrases. So this one was amazing it had a paragraph in that i couldn't even i had to read about 10 times it was so good if people don't know it's like whippo realized everyone's gonna blame me and my girlfriend for what happened and think we caused a problem so he goes wait a minute what if i credit her for everything that happened it's like ah that doesn't even make sense though does it it doesn't make sense on any level and he goes you know what it's going out like that so here's 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 what it's like here's what it's like thorin it's like the um it's like, you know, like an evangelical Christian athlete who's like, yes, it was the power of Jesus Christ that filled my soul and allowed me to win the game, right? It's like, no, we know it was you and your ability and your practice, but for some reason you're telling me that some sort of external factor was the one that inspired you to win, which is just, it's a wacky take in terms of religion. And it's, it's a wacky take in real life too, because sure, you know, people can rely on their significant others for emotional support, but you don't go and say that to in a public place where your teammates and coaches can read that because it's weird. And honestly, at the end of the day, it was you stepping up and taking that leadership role and altering the outcome for your team, which Whippo may well have done. He may have said, we need to change our mentality. Um, this is what we need to do. Worked with the coaching staff on that. But ultimately, it was it was a relationship between you and your teammates or you and your coaching staff and you and your team. Not that you had some sort of divine inspiration from your relationship that was the reason why this happened, right? Whippo himself still took the action at the end of the day. So that's why it's odd. Mate, after the way I saw that fucking twit longer, I bet he was fucking wide whip out. Looked like he'd be walking out of the room like, bloody hell, like, what's going on here, mate? What's going on? What the fuck is, what What baggage are you carrying around? This is mental, mate. Yeah, I, I, I just don't understand why you would put this out there. Like, this is, this is a private thing in your relationship. And also, by the way, um, ex- I think it's irresponsible to force her into the public eye because then there's this is a double-edged sword so you're trying to portray this as a positive thing for your team but the next time your team does badly how do you think the fans are going to react they're going to go after your girlfriend dude like people by the way i'll tell you right now if you don't ever actually mention who your significant other is or what your family situation we'll never comment on it it's not part of the public record it's nobody's business if you make it part of it you can't then later go how dare you talk about girl you couldn't stop talking about her you're writing mental things like a twit longer and the title is worlds and who made it work that's the fucking title we already know it's fire from the title i can't wait to read it then i go into it and literally like five sentences down he's going it's like a fucking it's like i'm listening it's like i'm looking at a fucking korean visual novel here he's going recently i hurt her a month ago i hurt her badly it was my fault it's like even this writing's just trash dude this is this the worst dialogue of it's all like time really like, bad at I know. film noir i know uh, <laughs> <laughs> and here's a good one he goes, you, you, you just see him, you just see him like in a fedora, like leaning against the wall in Iceland in black and white, just like smoking a cigarette recently. I heard her. I heard her badly. I also can't take it, right? When people do that thing, that is a very American thing where you just ask yourself rhetorical questions. Nobody's answering. And then answer me, go, was I surprised that it happened? Of course I was. Did I think it would happen again? Oh, certainly I did. It's like, who are you talking to right now? So he did this, right? If you skip down, he goes, now you may ask, why was week one so difficult? Yeah, that's something I'd ask. 
How isn't it her fault? But well, that's well, that's it. Like, if there's one question, I definitely wouldn't ask. It wouldn't be that one, would it? Like, what does that even mean? Who? What are you even talking about here, mate? This whole thing's just so mental, isn't it? I still want to know how her support is actually what made the whole world's work. And like this, it's like you say, Monty. It basically is like when I used to watch Anderson Silva just beat the fuck out of all the best fighters of all time, and then he would just say Jesus did it all. It's like, mate, listen, you do look like Jesus with you. But like, I, I think you did a lot more of that. I think it's mainly like you can slip Jesus and is all I know. people. That's fucked up, man. No. <laughs> no, Je- imagine, Jesus, Jesus imagine, has, some, has some vengeance in him. Damn! No, imagine being the guy who's a mega Christian who got the fuck beat out of him. You're like Jesus was doing that. What the? I was praying you before I came out here, and you're just cracking me in the face, knocking me out flat. What the fuck, Jesus? Why are you playing favorites for me? Why not just let it ride? Why not just let the boys fucking bang? And also, the cool way to do that is just to declare yourself an instrument of God and that you are delivering God's wrath on your sinning opponents. That's the cool way to do it. <laughs> hey, that would be a cool name, is if Bengi was actually called the instrument of God. There we now, go. That would be a fire name. See? Someone write that down. <laughs> that's good. It, it, see, that's, that's very appropriate. Should have used that go. one at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Because the joke is, you know, whenever it goes, Bengi was fake as God's right hand. It's like, when that case, no wonder, it did look like Faker was playing with his hand tied behind his fucking back half the time. I mean, <laughs> fire. There we go, write that one down. That's pretty good. Not bad. I, I just wonder what, what people do with their right hand. So I don't think it's a very good name. <laughs> I know, exactly, yeah. <laughs> all their fans are just wanking off over Bengi all the time, aren't they? Oh, Faker's right hand. Oh, Faker. Oh, right hand. Oh, I can't use my left. It's not as good. Yeah, I bet you can't. <laughs> fucking hell, give me a break. By the way, that was essentially just a joke that Nelson made. Brad just verbalised it and made it. <laughs> oh, you know, whatever. It's his joke, actually. Fair play to him. Fair play to him. <laughs> so having prepared against Fnatic this year, Nelson, working with G2 and, and you know, Bwipo's jokes aside about how weird this was from Bwipo, he has done a very good job of, of adapting to the jungle. I think he's been a smart player about it. Um, everybody was expecting pretty good things from Fnatic until Upset mysteriously disappeared. Um, I think their performance, in spite of lacking Upset, was still pretty good good i think they lacked the clutch factor and and the kind of star potential that they had with upset but bean wasn't a bad player overall um how did you feel about Fnatic having prepared against them many times and seen them throughout the playoffs i, I think definitely affected them a lot because i think upset and Bupo, uh, upset Bupo and her saying they were like the core parts of the team i think with upset i think you, you can know for sure that so and Hilda saying they would just get a lead in lane like 90%, 99% of the time. And I think it affected draft a lot as well because there are many like combinations of champions or things which they practice that they could just pull out blind. But I think with a different AD carry, you can't. And I mean, I think they were during the split, they were fine, right? Like they, draft, they drafted like really strong champions top side so that. Adam can win win his lane, try to affect mid lane, try to win the fight at Harrow, and then snowball upset, which I think is also an okay way to play. But I think this this world when upset wasn't there and they didn't have the voice in in game, then they they just didn't play as well, especially week one. I mean, I, I think, think it, there is one. there's truth in in what Whippo was saying too, which is that I think the biggest factor was them just being mental boomed from the entire situation because it seems like Upset had to leave very very suddenly, like the day before their games. That's that's a fucking hard situation. So, I mean, I do think that getting over that psychologically was probably the toughest barrier because I didn't think their play in and of itself was terrible, especially once they got to the second round robin. One thing I hated was that, what, that everyone from LEC decided that the new narrative that we're going to ride till the end is that this is all about gaslighting everyone, that the Bean guy is an LEC quality player who tomorrow should be in it. Like, why is this the storyline? He's literally a replacement player who nobody was trying to get to play from. Like, he, he had maybe like one or two games were all right. Okay. That's it. Like, it was, you'd expect him to lose every game and get shit on. Like, why build this fake storyline? I know this, by the way, LEC fans are so out of control now. They're almost bordering on LCS fans, Monty. Because you've seen with Carlos, they take this fucked approach where they actually think LEC is a thing. It's a tangible entity. It's not a region of people trying to battle each other. It's a thing where, like, Carlos's main job, for real, should be trying to make his rivals as strong as possible so LEC fans can enjoy multiple... T- by the way, his job is 
the opposite of that. His job is to crush all his rivals, make them as weak as possible, and easily win the LEC every single time with all the best players. That's by definition his literal job. But again, you guys don't understand what being an owner is about, and you think socialism is what the fucking league's about. So similarly, right, people also do this thing I think sucks so much, where they're a fan of Fnatic, or they're a fan of G2, or they're a fan of, like, Rogue. And what they do is, they would never want Chekalad to play for their team, but they go, I've decided, I, I decree, Chekalad is an LEC level player, so another team, not mine of course, must take him on. Well, if we're going to play that game, I've got all sorts of players I'll be putting in Fnatic next year. Tell you what, you should sign that Bean guy. Sign him as fucking mid laner. Why? Fuck you. That, the, if skin in the game is this, if you think he's good, ask your team to sign him. If he isn't you know, good enough for your team, shut the fuck up. I, I miss the good old days of Europe, Thorne. You, re you remember, well, we weren't alive for this, but historically, Europe has basically just been the continent of war where everyone just hated each other and all these nationalities. And because... It's just kind of a wide open continent. People were constantly invading each other, et cetera, et cetera. It was the creation of the European Union that really just like now the Europeans think of themselves as like some sort of apparently they think of themselves as like some sort of group of is it one country? Because like in the in the United States, we have these different states that are very different culturally from each other. Uh, and it kind of feels like different countries when you move around a lot of the time. And I feel like Europe has just become that equivalent in like the last 50 years because of the creation of the European Union. Uh, but let's go back to the way it used to be Europe, where you just all really, really didn't like each other and thought of yourselves as separate entities, because that might fix this problem. Nelson, again, right. no comment on Empire. <laughs> <Not really bad. laughs> all I'm going to say yeah. is this. All I'm going to say is this. One of the most hilarious... It's a joke. Calm down. One of the most hilarious wars in history, because of the name of the war, would give you such a different perspective, is the Opium Wars. Because you're going to think, oh, what was that? Was that like rival drug? No, Britain literally had a war against China where the premise was, because they won, we get to sell them Opium. That is one of the most simultaneously fucked but hilarious premises for a war I've ever heard of. It's fucking, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's gangster as fuck. If you think The Sopranos is good, that's ten times better than The Sopranos. All they did is kill oh. people. So the problem, the problem that that Britain had with with China and why the Opium Wars happened, as I understand it, is that the Chinese were only allowing Western traders in very specific ports in China, and they wouldn't actually trade goods. They would only trade Chinese products for silver. And so England got mad because they didn't want to give them only silver. They wanted to actually like trade real goods with right. them in order to, you know, be able to have more bargaining power, right, et cetera, et cetera. And so they had to fight the war and, and like flood the market so they could actually trade opium to China, get the Chinese population addicted to it. And that way they could grow poppies in india and other places in asia and then just make opium and then transport it to china for for the chinese goods that they wanted so it's all really fucked up but <laughs> there was a, there was an actual yeah. reason but remember though that actually did play out with a similar theme when g2 at season nine worlds traded the chance to become world champions for silver oh it was kind of a <laughs> playback on the theme you know throwback <laughs> there you go We're very good. Very good. <laughs> We've had a lot of historical sidebars Pretty so good, far this episode. Uh -huh. let's, let's wrap up with some actual predictions because uh, we do have to get to viewer questions. And if we're talking about the Opium Wars and the reasons why they started, I think we're, we've gone too yeah, deep. It's a little bit off. We've got, we've sort of done a blimp all metaphorically on our own show, haven't we? Why are we talking about that? Stick to the facts. <laughs> all right. So RNG versus EDG. Um, you're pretty high on RNG, it sounds like, Nelson. Do you yeah. think this is an RNG win over EDG? It, it, but are you conflicted? Because aren't you like the biggest Flandre fan ever? Yeah, oh, I mean, that's a meme. He doesn't. He's just friends with him, really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think RNG has been playing like their style the best. But I think if EDG can adapt, which they showed they can, right? In summer, they showed that they could adapt and play towards top side. I think they can win. And I think overall, EDG has the better roster, but RNG has like more flexibility on the top side. Even though, like, even though I think like Flandre is already one of the more flexible top players in terms of champion pool, but Xiaohu is even more. I'll give you mark for this one. I've got EDG winning the series because even though I, I actually really do like the way Xiaohu plays, I can't abide a world where Gala and Crying is going to win this series and then go to the finals. So I'm just saying EDG is a better team. They somehow win. I'll say 3-1. 
it does yeah. seem likely that whoever wins this matchup is destined for the finals. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way the, the bracket draw worked. I think EDG, I'm really hoping they win because I think they'll deliver a more compelling finals than RNG. I, I think Ryan is, he can't be allowed. He must be stopped now. Um, they need to replace that mid laner ASAP. This is the only thing that will convince them to do it. If they make a world finals, it makes me sad because they might not make roster changes. So I would like to see EDG overall oh. winning this matchup. I think they're the better team. I think even though RNG, the meta is playing into their wheelhouse in certain ways, I think that EDG is the more complete team, is the better roster, should be winning this matchup. If yeah, RNG think... wins worlds, this is the nickname, the Ming Dynasty. Oh. <laughs> there you go. That's, That's good. Fire. That's fire. Yeah, I mean, both of these teams, they are known to be like the, the kings of Civil War, you know? Like, they like... And especially RNG, where they have never lost to a Chinese team at international events. So okay, I think anything can happen when it's like a local matchup. But I would say EDG win, probably 3-1. All right, next. Genji Cloud9, other part uh -huh. of that same bracket. I, uh, I think Cloud9 is uh, going to win this, but uh, it's, uh, it's I'll, pick, I'll pick any other team except HLE to beat Genji. So. <laughs> I've said mine, Genji 3-2. <laughs> I, I don't want to watch more Gen G games, so I will say it's partially biased, but I think that obviously, as Thorne alluded to earlier, I think any absolutely any result is possible in this best of five. 3 0 Cloud9, 3 0 Gen G, both on the table, very close match, also on the table. Um, I think I think Cloud9 should be able to take the appropriate proactive plays in the late game and that early game mistakes they make will not be snowballed by Gen G and punished enough. Um, so cloud nine, I think has a realistic chance in any game that they play. Uh, so I I'm going to take C nine here. All right, he's had it off. He, listen, he's not going to tolerate people <laughs> predicting BBD to lose to cloud nine. <laughs> Also, by um, the way, here's, I won't lie, another reason why I want it to be 3-2, either way, is because all I need, listen, I do I do actually find it very, when a real legit narrative does play out, I find it very satisfying. I need it to be 2-1 for Gen G, and then game four, that you bring up that stat with perks, and even if he doesn't win the series, he just has to win game four. They leave LeBron Copen, Instalock, goes around the map, wrecks them all. Obviously, they all try <laughs> to get the fucking clone, he's like, haha. Don't worry, that was Halus or whatever. And then just a reference way beyond all your time. And then win, then lose the series. Genji probably should win the series, I think, overall, though. We'll see. <laughs> I, I, I really have a, not very much faith in, in Genji right now. So we will see. Uh, I, there's no way I think anybody here would take Hanwa over T1, right? I still don't even know what Han was done. That's impressive. Basically, like, win a BO1 no. against RNG. Who gives a fuck? I said RNG, <laughs> st like, staggered through that group stage, didn't they? That, I think that is actually low-key, as I said before. Look, it's not the worst team to ever get to the round of eight. Remember, we had, like, a wild card team one year. We've had some, like, NA teams. But, like, in terms of this tournament, like, holy fuck, did T1 look out with this quarters draw that's mental <laughs> remember that could have been fucking e oh it could have been EDG because that could have been uh, uh, Mad Lions yeah yeah and uh, I, I think if you look at this you know it's a it's a matchup that T1 has won this year already and it's a better meta T1 looks like a better team than they were when they last played Hanwa looks basically the same basically what you would expect out of this roster I haven't seen I guess you could say Deft is performing better but does that actually Stop. matter in this meta Probably not that much, considering Gumiyushi's been doing fine as well. So I don't Ultimate. really see an angle. How many fucking times does Death have to be in the quarterfinals of Worlds and just get his fucking heart broken? This is a joke. This is a joke. It's like another guy, like, just, I want to be in all the playoffs of Worlds. Well, you can have that, mate. See, enjoy that. Yeah, not another one. I mean, Death, Death and Chovy, they have the same issue, right? Which is why they chose to team up. But they didn't choose the right teammates. I know, exactly that. By the way, you haven't thought that one through, have you? I always get fucked by my teammates. So do I. Do you want to get fucked by our teammates together? <laughs> Why not? What? <laughs> Why have you done this twice? Why would you do that twice in a row? And also, let's be real. If you want to talk about longevity, every other player to ever play League of Legends can fuck off compared to Deft. His longevity is mental. Like, the guy is legitimately, again, one of the best at his role in Season 11. He started playing professionally in Season 2. 
That there's no one can even come close to that. That's unbelievable. Yep. <laughs> he's still here and, he, and he's been performing well at so far. Definitely among the, the top 80 carries, I would say. Um, let's move on to, to Dom Juan versus Mad Lions, though, because we haven't talked about either of these teams a whole lot. Um, Khan is having a, a very good tournament. They look very well prepared for the meta. Um, I will say the knock against them is that their group ended up being a lot weaker than we initially anticipated. Um, probably, you know, with FPX failing, I don't know if they've actually been challenged uh, to this point in time, but Showmaker is having a hell of a tournament. Khan is having a hell of a tournament. Uh, Ghost and Barrel don't seem like the necessarily the weak point that we thought coming in. And even if they were, I don't think it's necessarily makes anything unwinnable for them because the bot lane hasn't been the most vital part of the meta overall. I think it's, it's I think it's really hard for Met Lions. I think. Because I think it's different from MSI. I think Dom One is even stronger right now. Um, I think it's probably a trio. Uh, that hard. I mean, I think Mad Lions is interesting because they at least have shown the flashes of comeback potential that we saw from them in they the playoffs. They have been clutch at times. Uh, they have been clutch, you but know, also the the game put that way. You know, also they're running with some pretty fringe meta picks right now. Like the Victor, I think, was surprising from yeah. Humanoid. Um, the NAR has not been a high priority pick in the group stage. It was more in play-ins. Um, and so I guess for me, you know, humanoid has been a bit underwhelming. Uh, Karzy also has been good on Ezreal, but kind of bad on the Aphilios, which historically you kind of expect. But I think the problem for me is really the matchup because Mad Lions isn't playing well enough in the bot lane to exploit the weaknesses that we see. And there's a pretty big difference between two kind of professional level tier one major rookies in El Yoya and Armut compared to Khan and Canyon. And for me, I just can't see a way that Mad Lions actually wins this series because they're 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 overpowered at their strong positions by better players on on Dom Juan. And their bot lane isn't right now in a place where I think they can actually just dominate through the bot lane. And even if they were doing that, it's hard to win that way in this meta. So it feels like all the factors are just kind of conspiring against Mad Lions. Uh, I have this I mean, three zero damn one. Yeah, I, I think like I think the only way Matt wins the game is like they have a better scaling draft, and they manage to go even in like the first twenty minutes, you know. But Matt, Matt Lions early game has not been very good, and I don't think they can. It's possible to punish Damon's bot lane if they pick Jin. You just can't punish that champion. It's what's brutal if you're the Mad Lions as well. Like, look who else you could have gotten. You could have gotten T1. You could have gotten RNG. These teams, I'd at least be like, this is an interesting matchup. You've gotten actually the most boring matchup. Like, it should actually just be a stomp from Dam 1. I feel bad for Mad Lions. They're going to unfortunately look back and go, fuck, if we'd have won that one mad tiebreaker in a day when we played like six games or something, then we could have had a good bracket draw. Instead, it's going to be one of those boring ones where we're not even probably even going to get to see what they're capable of. And remember, of all the fucking Western teams, just like GT, this is a best of five team. This is a team that excels in series play and you've put them against basically the most unbeatable team at the tournament so far. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, I I think it's it's just really tough. It's it's hard to see any angle where Mad Lions has a theoretical chance of victory because it's not like Dom Juan's been choking in the late game. Their early game's been extremely strong. They're snowballing their advantages. Their individual players are performing. I would argue above, especially in cons, Con Ghost and Barrel are performing above expectations. Um, Showmaker and Canyon are performing to expectations. So it seems like they're peaking at the right time. The meta's suiting them. Uh, it, it's it's difficult to say that they are not the favorites of the entire tournament and with Mad Lions never really regaining the form they had in the LEC playoffs. Did you, have you felt like they dropped uh, off since the, 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 the LEC playoffs? Here's the thing, yeah. well, ask that a second, but here's the problem. That does mean, because I always try to like balance out narratives and figure out, well, this one goes count. The problem is, Monty, you essentially are predicting Khan will win Worlds and then ride off into the sunset. Yep, yep I am. 
<laughs> and then, by the way, no matter how good we do, the battle is lost at that point in time. Monty. The fans will say he was the best. Of it. We'll never, he was we'll never always good. Back. We'll never get it back. We'll never get it back. It's over at that point. He, he was never a choker. He won Worlds. Exactly. I know. It's, yeah. it's unfortunate. Yeah. Look, I would be very happy for him if that was the narrative. Like, I don't wish people to fail. Oh. And if, if Khan has the tournament of his life and retires as a world champion, that's just sick. I'm happy for him. You know what I mean? But Here's the thing, though, Monty, I've just realized. This is like back in the day when we did have Darren who tortured the fucking Korean players because he's played such a... Of all the people who could be the guy who fucks it all up for Khan, how about some Turkish guy that just forces Wukong picks? Oh, oh, would that be rich? Like your last tournament ever, somehow losing to some motherfucker who goes, I don't even really care about the game. I barely play. Lock me Wukong in in any meta. Imagine losing to that guy. That is some Darian shit. That's like... I, What's he doing that's so genius? He doesn't even know me. He doesn't even know. <laughs> I would love I it. I would fucking love it. I think even in MSI, it, it was it was it was not very close. And right now I think Khan is like probably having the the form of his life. Sure. Yeah. I mean, to put it into context, guys, when when Dom Juan came into MSI, Khan had played like 15 scion games in the spring split and he was basically just a one trick scion bot um and did did break out of that a little bit at msi but certainly broke out of it during the summer split and so there's a dimension that he's bringing to dom Juan's play right now that is entirely different from the form that we saw at msi they have significantly more versatility he is actively carrying games on high dps champions and his team is playing through him so this is there is it's night and day between that dom one that that played a compelling series against mad lions and what we're seeing right now and on top of that mad lions isn't even in good form right now they're in worse form i would say than they were in the lec playoffs and so there's a bit pretty big divergence unfortunately i would have loved to have seen this be a really competitive semi-final um, but it looks like it's going to be a pretty one-sided quarterfinal instead. Yeah. I mean, I don't think they're... Of, of, of course, I think it's going to be a 3-0, right? But I don't think Met Lions are playing worse. I think it's just teams in Europe who are just not good enough because teams in Europe only know how to engage and walk in front. Walk. Like, nobody knows how to kite backwards. But I think the, the Asian teams are different. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, what you're seeing out of the, yes. the Asian team? I think the, the the really top tier teams, they know how to kite. They know they know how to position where. Even if they get engaged on, it's like not, not all of the carries will get engaged on at the same time. Especially in fights where they want to contest or objectives where they want to contest with you. And in well, Europe, and, yeah, go on, keep going. Yeah, in, in Europe, it's like I think Europe is. Is basically you can just look at Kaiser and Hillesang where he just perma engage. But teams are not prepared to fight. I think I think chi China and the best teams in Korea they are right right now. They are all they are always prepared to fight, so they always position like a lot better, and they they know not to overchase and to kite backwards, especially it's, when at main engage. You yeah. set me up perfectly because I was going to say that's when you will actually know if there is any hope whatsoever in this series. In game one, if Kaisa can't if can't get off those fucking sick engages, he was getting off in that like all those games in the groups. It's over. It's over because it, mate, like that Rakan game he had was mental. You couldn't you couldn't fight the guy. Next, <laughs> that's it. That, that's those are all the quarterfinals. So that was down one win worlds, Nelson. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, if, if they are, if they play like this, and then and bot lane doesn't matter at all, then I, I think down one wins. Wrong answer. EDG plays him in the final. Viper does exploit Ghost. It's over. Scout wins worlds. How you like that? How you like them apples? <laughs> <laughs> Someone yeah, clip yeah. this when it happens. Clip this when it happens. <laughs> and I think it's also possible. I think it's like forty sixty. If it's EDG against. If it's like EDG or RNG against that one, I think like 40, 60. I'm That's actually really... I want to say. I want to say down one EDG. I'm, I'm really upset that we got both Chinese teams on the same side of the bracket because it, those LPL matches, whenever we see an LPL best of series at Worlds, it's always weird. Like they revert to like a local regional China meta. We see like the mind games. They, they like mind game themselves from all of the previous matches that they've played. 
and it often results in in kind of like weird winners or weird uh you know, weird outcomes. And so I am afraid that RNG will just sub, like randomly win this. And then we get a very one-sided final where Dom Juan kind of wrecks RNG. Uh, I would much rather personally see the, the Dom Juan EDG matchup because I think it's much more exciting. I mean, that's just the storyline, right? Just to get revenge for MSI. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not super hyped on that matchup, at least at the, the current point in time. So. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Nelson. We're going to take a quick break and do viewer questions after this. So stick around for a little bit longer. We'll do those and then we'll be done with the show. All right. Here's where we do our viewer questions for GrogCoin25 holders. You want information about that? Go to the Discord channel for Inside on Esports. There's a GrogCoin Lounge channel and a pinned uh, message there where you can learn about Grog and how you too can ask viewer questions. So first one up, usually when someone is getting started in a new area slash career, they tend to see problem areas of concern for their field, and they start to come up with potential solutions for these problems. As time goes by, they start to realize that those aren't bugs, but features. Yes, this is true. That the reason these problems exist is not due to lack of solutions, but that people at the top don't either don't want to or are too scared to try. At what moment in your careers in esports did you guys come to that realization? I'll chuck in one extra factor, which is the other one is this. And this is probably the biggest nightmare with people who've been to university, right? Dude, I can't handle people who graduate from university and think they're an expert in their field. You're someone who just finished their driving exam and thinks you could drive in Formula One. You're out of your fucking mind. All your knowledge is theoretical. So another thing that happens, Monty, is people come in and they go, this is stupid. Why don't they do X, Y, and Z? And it's like, well, I could sit you down and explain why, but it'll take you five years experience to know why we don't do that. Like, basically, the other thing is they think problems are very simple to solve and some problems are absurdly complicated and involve like a million factors you can't know, basically, until you've done it yourself. Yeah. So sometimes issues are just so complicated. There are logistic concerns. Um... I mean, I think that the, the interesting thing, though, is that this applies to certain areas, but esports is a relatively new field. So we don't actually have a lot. The blockers are often just put there for no reason. And there's there's like actually no reason why things can't be done differently. Um, almost always it's because people are too lazy to do the additional effort to change the thing in question. Um, or we have people who come from outside industries that then say that problems exist because they existed in their industries, but that they don't actually exist in the world of esports whatsoever. Uh, but they just, uh, they take, they bring the assumptions with them. And I think that's the biggest problem actually. Um, I mean, sometimes there are, you can't do things for real reasons. Like we can't have a best of three of best of fives for the league of legends world championship because the game is not in a state a financial state where we could rent a stadium for days that we may not use right that's uh, as much as i would like that to to be the grand finals of worlds where we have a best of of best ofs um to decide the champion over multiple days that's i understand that that's not an option at this point in time unless you do ti style crowdfunding <laughs> that's true that's true, that's true. Yeah. I would say one of the main problems is like in terms of what he's talking about, like the amount of years it took to get in there. I would say it takes a long time because you have to really have a lot of industry connections before you start to see like sort of how the fucking sausage is made as it was. Like, for example, it was only when I did this Flashpoint project in CSGO that I actually discovered what I think is an incredibly alarming trend, which is that the one group of people who should be the most open to like risk reward thinking are the fucking team org owners. Because right now they're in such a bad spot that players make all the money. The people who are the game devs make all the money. And it's the yep. TOs and the team orgs, the tournament organizers and the team orgs. They're the ones who are basically in a high risk, high reward industry where basically it shouldn't even be about making money. It's about being positioned to be number one now or at the point where it makes money. Instead, the ones in the middle who are just losing money out the ass are the most play it safe, milk toss. I'm just going to follow the leader, motherfuckers in the whole industry. It's crazy. They're exactly, that's why, by the way, I love people like Carlos. Because what I love about him is, first of all, not only will he try and actually make like really interesting moves, but as you see with this roster this year, any other team owner who had this roster would do one of these two things. One, just run it entirely back. You keep all the players, you run it back. Or two, you cut one 
one, maybe two players. He is cutting three fifths of the squad. Everyone else said was the best possible lineup in Europe because he understands fundamentally it was broken and he is going to gamble that he can make the moves to totally redesign the squad and go back to the top. And I tell yeah. you what, if he does it, you can't say it was the players. It can't have been them. He's even, by the way, rehauling the whole fucking org to make it work. Like that is that is big balls play. But I tell you what, that's how you get to number one again. Yep. I mean, it's the only way to fix that situation, too, because I, I think Mad Lions deserves a lot of credit as well for what they did with their roster. Oh. Taking a team last year that performed very well, not running it back and identifying and fixing those problems to do even better. But it's a risk. It's always a risk. Uh, ideally, I want League to remain unpatched like Brood War and let the meta naturally evolve through innovation and new discovery. Unfortunately, Riot will likely keep making drastic changes to keep the game fresh for plebs because it's garnered them so much success over the years. Yes, this is true. As a compromise, what if League has predetermined themes, say three to four made public during the offseason that rotate every few months? Assassins, Juggernaut, Split Push, Enchanter, Poke metas. Wouldn't this make GMing less of a headache and allow players to better prepare and adapt increasing the overall game quality at the professional level. Um, so actually, I think this the changes this year are less drastic, as far as we know so far, than most of the other years of changes that have occurred. They're pretty minor. Like we're not, we're not seeing like the whole item system overhauled or the jungle, like they're tweaks that are being made. So I think it's a little bit better this time around. But unfortunately, like there is a fundamental issue with video games some video games where they feel like the developers just feel like they have to continuously reinvent them. And that is a strategy. I think there's two strategies to keep players around. Either you change nothing or you change everything constantly. Um, you can't really strike a middle ground. And so I think basically with Counter-Strike, you see very little changed, almost nothing, I would say. And then with League of Legends, you see huge amounts of stuff changed every year. Um, one of the, in Counter-Strike, it's people who have a love for the game who want to keep playing it and don't want to have to think about all of the changes that are made. And in League of Legends, it feels like a fresh start for people where they can they enjoy the process of relearning it every year. Now, relearning the game every year is terrible for the professional scenes because it creates different priorities in terms of which pro players are good, which means you don't have really long... You, you, it's harder to have, like long-term player narratives than it is in a game like Counter-Strike where the same skill set can keep you on top for many, many years. The main problem is, hypothetically, yes, I think that sounds like an interesting idea, having themes and rotating them and you know advance what's coming in the summer and what's in the spring and you can prepare for worlds. Yeah, it's a GM concept. It's a good one. It's just it will absolutely never happen because it goes so counter to Riot's philosophy of balance, which is not at all to plan for the future. What they do is patch to patch every few weeks. They tweak one thing up. They tweak another thing down. They tweak a different thing up the next time. They tweak another thing down. They don't, they, they themselves, like I remember once, I think it was fuck I'm trying to think who it was that we had on Listen Local it might even have been Jat or someone it was someone that was involved with Riot and they basically explained the process of how a patch gets changed and the fact that because the PBE is a few weeks ahead of like the live one and then the live ones it's like basically the joke was if you ever looked in it might even have been Zyrene Basi or maybe it was the Blastoise guy to be fair actually I think we had that guy on the show they basically explained that you don't even get that long essentially you get a few days to test if a patch was good a few days so as a result, like what you're talking about is great, but it essentially implies I'm going to have a rough sense of what I'm going to do for the whole year. I don't think Riot's working that way. I think they're way more sort of going by the seat of their pants and just hoping it works out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of it, but it is, it is what it is in this game. Apparently it's working for the plebs. I think it makes it really hard on GMs and the professional scene. I think that the most egregious thing that they still don't do is put the dragon spawn order within the champ select, which is going to be even worse when they add two more dragons next year. It's going to be complete bullshit. So hope they change that. Hope they actually add the dragon order in champ select. That would be great for the professional. The problem scene. is this. I don't know anyone in any game ever in esports who balanced the game well, except one man. He is called Ice Frog. Now, the problem with that is you can't just say, just get your own ice frog. There aren't any more. That's the whole point. If you don't even know, by the way, when all these MOBAs were coming out, the motherfucker just went and basically freelanced with all of them and then decided which one he wanted to work with. So what's ridiculous is he's the only person I'm aware of who's ever done proper balance changing and kept it like he can change things radically, but it ends up being good. And then he knows how to keep it. It's he's, this guy is actually like a genius, whoever the fuck he is. Like he really is like some massive game changer that we don't have in other games, I'm afraid. They don't exist. 
Do you think reading a book is greater than or equal to audio books? And happy birthday to me. Thank you. Uh, do you think, uh, I, I think reading a book is, it, it, the information, I retain information much better when I read a book. But I will say that audiobooks are useful, especially for me when I go on like long car drives, because in America, you, you tend to go on like multi-day car drives uh, when you're taking a bunch of shit from location A to location B. So I do like audiobooks under those circumstances, or I like them when I'm like taking a walk or something like that. But it, for me, I retain the information much better when I just read it. The problem is the only audiobooks I've ever listened to were like cassettes, and I can't handle one person doing all the voices. I can't take it. It's why I could never understand people who enjoy like Germans just listening to like a fucking guy dub a woman's voice. It's like, does that not take you out of the movie, dude? Like, how are you handling this? So I can't handle it personally. I just like to read the books. Uh, a couple shows back, I got my former LCS teams uh, who started Majority Input port rosters and who tried to build around star asian mid laners and who started impact top lane confused instead of team impulse do you have any entertaining nrg oh this is from the team impulse question we didn't this didn't... question start so, over so i don't understand you know, any of that. it's phrased badly so remember <laughs> we were asked about entertaining stories from team impulse on the last show and we were like i don't know and then this is entertaining nrg esports stories i still don't have anything like uh, I think he's talking about like the OQ roster that occurred. It was kind of weird when they were trying to qualify for the LCS, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I could ask, like, I know Andy Miller and like Brett, the people who run NRG, they're friends of mine, but I haven't heard any weird stories from that era. No specific a question. Just ask it. Do we have any funny stories? We might have some like general, like, like if you're just obsessed with that one team, you just shout a lock, aren't you? Rephrase it another way next week so you can get it, but you're not going to get it. There's nothing there. The well's dry. Uh, as someone who generally consumes most of the content from Monty and Thora via audio format due to my profession, I am curious what, if any, uh, go-to audio content beyond music do they listen to? Any audio books you would recommend? I a lot of audio book question. Um, I, so <laughs> here's, here's a very Monty answer. I, I do have an Audible subscription, and I use it both to listen to novels, um, you know, when I'm driving with my wife in a car, like I just alluded to. But if I'm out on a walk or something like that, typically I will listen to what are called the great courses. So these are lecture series from university professors. Um, I'm listening to a 30 hour long lecture series that's broken down into like 45 or an hour long segments about the history of Western music right now. So I really like that one because the the professor who does it is very engaging. And also you get to listen to the audio samples um, of the development of Western music as he describes it. So I think that one's pretty good. But I have a bunch of these like great courses, things that I listen to. And then in terms of podcasts, I like Radio Lab. Um, I think that one's pretty interesting. Invisibilia, some of the NPR ones from America that I enjoy. Uh, the problem is the really good podcasts I listen to are none of your fucking business and they're top secret. You don't get to find out what they're about. <laughs> I already have enough fucking problems in my life as it is. So I would just say this. I like to listen to... I mean, I don't as much now because I listen to all of them. Like any any Terence McKenna lecture, it's pretty good. You can put that on at any point in time. Any podcast Naval Rakant goes on, usually pretty insightful. Uh, let me think. I've actually is there actually one I could recommend? Let me think. Let me just think. There might there must be one surely. Fuck, what would it be? Mm, let me think. I thought I had one. Oh, I actually do like to listen to Jordan Peterson's lectures because basically he's one of those guys, a bit like LS. If you have to like learn what their idiosyncrasies are and what their like predilections are, what they prefer and how they build up the stock. But once you know like sort of the patois, as it were, that's fine. Those very interesting. Basically, it's like I want to know what does he think about Thinker X and then he'll like unpack the whole thing. So basically, if you go, like I'll give you an example of one, someone most of you won't know who it is, this guy called John Piaget. Just go and look at the lecture he did on this guy. It'd probably be mega interesting. You don't know anything about this guy, but he's a super interesting individual individual all right next what do you think of bringing every team from lol worlds and the csgo major to a renaissance fair <laughs> which events would you want to add or modify to show the various games and teams strengths 
uh, as I don't just want jacked up Nordic Vikings and NA Adderall free fiends to win for free. So I guess he's asking what Renaissance fair competitions would we uh, use? The only to... one I know is the joust. What else is that? I've never been to one. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't actually know either. Cause the ones I've been to, the competitions are mostly like just the jousting. And then I think what's actually funny about that is tr- seeing them interact with all like the LARPers and people, which is part of the reason why you go to these Renaissance fairs is because they make fun of you and it's, it's entertaining. Um, I'm assuming so, there must be some sort of a game where it's like, you know, you throw horseshoes at something else. Is there something like that? Like a throwing thing where you have to get something on? Maybe archery must be one, surely. Yeah. Not that, not that I've seen, no. but I haven't been to that many Renaissance fairs. I mean, as far I, as I knew, it's like you say, it's basically just people LARPing badly and then drinking <laughs> beer isn't it is that basically what the whole thing and, is and and eating turkey legs at least that's what it is in america so <laughs> i mean i i don't know if it's much of a competition it, it for for various uh attendees i would say but hmm, who knows which metal gear solid is better two or three i fucking hate metal gear i fucking hate metal gear i i think I think the writing and the characters are just so absolute trash in those games. They're ridiculous. They make no sense. I guess I would say Metal Gear Solid 2 is better than 3, but I think that probably that is the most overrated video game series of all time. The problem is I've only played two. I played one and two, basically. And the problem is two was worse. So I was like, ah, whatever. Like, I thought I would eventually get to play in all the other ones. But then, unfortunately, that I had a 20-year career in eSports. I haven't had time. So, and, <laughs> and by the way, all the people I know were legit were like, actually, they were shit. They weren't that good. So I haven't really missed anything, I don't think. None, none of them are as good as the first one, let's be real. That one's just, just a fucking sweet spot in it. Uh, even then, it, it does have some stupid stuff in it. Like, when you can go in that box or whatever, and then fucking, you know, it has some stupid shit in it for sure. <laughs> uh who's more mentally ill the romanian nutter who wanted to put anders in a box or a league of legends reddit mod i don't know about the romanian guy who wanted to put anders in a box can you explain this to me basically there was a story years and years ago with the guy who was at the time nip's coach a player called peter from sweden and basically he did like a charity initiative where he was going to raise money that would go towards like buying houses for people who'd been flooded out in his like native serbia or something where he's like ethnically from and then essentially he raised the money and cause anders like was involved with like lending a paypal because it had gone over the overflow on the other one this guy was romanian looked into this whole story and like was like did he was some like sort of like journalist or something and basically he went to like insane lengths that he went to the country that the guy the coach claimed he'd gone to to buy a car and asked to look at the records and saw that he had bought a car. oh he went to mad lengths but problem is he was the sort of person it was like a movie in a movie he'd be the hero and at the end he'd solve the case and it'd all be proven right right this guy because it just went unresolved and nothing happened just went not and so he just sent a message to Anders, I think it was on Twitter even, that just said, if you come to the Collusion of Poker Major, you will go home in a box. And they had to essentially get a, like, basically like a restraining order against this motherfucker coming to the event. So that one's pretty out there. I will say, though, here's the thing. That guy in his own fucked up, like, psychology and world had sort of a reason to be resentful or a reason to think it wouldn't, like, you know, this is unfair, like, no justice hasn't been done. The people on Reddit, you don't understand. They just are people. You know, in high school, the hall monitor, the loser motherfucker who wants to have the tiniest bit of power and abuse it. That's just, they are those people, literally. Like basically when they when they banned Richard years ago, he used his journalistic skills to literally find out who these people are in real life. And they were the biggest losers you could ever imagine. It was ridiculous. So I, I on some level, listen, they can't be as bad as someone who's trying to potentially murder someone. But they're listen, in their own fucked way, they're not great. I mean, I would just say that thing I said yesterday. They literally deleted from the official Riot stream the host of LCS doing a tribute to a deceased member of talent in esports. And the reason was it isn't directly related to League of Legends. Does that not say all you need to know about these people? That was more important than ever letting it slide for one second. Meanwhile, they let it slide a million times when it phases them. Chef Gamsu, for example. like it, it's, just, it's beyond a fucking joke. Isn't it? It's beyond a joke. <laughs> Ten years of this shit. <laughs> uh any book slash author recommendations for magical realism literature i'm not huge on magical realism so i've read like gabriel garcia marquez like you know 100 days of solitude what we recommended a few weeks ago it's got to be the fucking uh italiano book 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Invisible Cities. That's gonna be a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, here's here's a outside the box one. There's a, a book by a Russian author named Pelyavin, uh, which is called Buddha's Little Finger. That I, it's, it's kind of magical realism, but that's a that's a very fascinating, uh, very fascinating book. Uh, very weird. Uh, but we'll just really say all good. the Jodorowsky comics. That's basically one sure. of his essential themes. He always solves things in sort of like a, a basically what he does is he takes like spiritual concepts, but then uses them as like a real world way you solve a problem, which obviously wouldn't really work in real life. But in fiction, you can do what you want with ideas, can't you? So it's just just a cool way to tell a story and sort of get round what you thought would be a dead end. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I I find the definitions of magical realism. I I I find it difficult to know which books people define as magical realism because it's i feel like a term people splash all over in it yeah it's, like it, it's, modern, it, it's just applied to everything yeah it's just kind of blurred um so i guess like one of my favorite books which you've talked about before which is bulgakov's master and margarita it would also technically be considered magical realism maybe by some people just like i don't know if buddha's little finger or Pelyavin is considered magical realism but i could understand why it would no kind of fall into that bucket uh so there you go. There's some names. Uh, it's been almost a year and a half since Thorin's Western LOL goat rankings were posted. Do any new players, oh, this is a good question, deserve to be put on the list or are the new players getting close? And shout out to you, Heretic798. You provided the list for reference. God bless you. So it oh, was well. number one, Perks. Number two, Caps. Three, Froggen. Four, Xpeke. Five, Soaz. Six, Double Lift. Seven, Yankos. 8 Reckless, 9 Bjergsen, 10 Jensen, 11 Forgiven, 12 Wonder, 13 Diamond Prox, 14 Mithy, 15 Sven, and 16 Yellow Star. Hmm. Let me think. Who would go on the list that isn't on there? I think maybe you could... Oh, uh, maybe there... Hellasang? Maybe I Hellasang. Hellasang on my list. Yeah, I think he yeah. could he could creep on over some of those names. I think that's. I also look at the body of work he's put together now. It's got plenty of years now as an elite player. Um, I think there are players that are starting to have enough years to enter this list. Potentially, like Hans would be another one lower on the list overall. Um, I think probably players like Humanoid, even though they've had very good performances, are still too new. Like we need to see more years. Out of the Mad Lions players, this way I think give like as I alluded to Nelson, give him a couple of years and upset will be on this list. Yeah, I think, it, I think the thing about upset that's cool is this: he's shown it on all types of teams. He's just actually got like a winner's mindset. By the way, he is the player, like I said before, who goes get the fuck out of my way and give me the ball. That's that's it. That is his game. Yeah, I think I think there are some players that like upset like humanoid that in a year or two might be might be on this list oh i think the other obvious one uh it's got to be kaiser i think give yeah. him a few yeah. more years yep. he's primed to get on there i think that's fair so but that's a, that's me, a few names. i mean for me this list is mostly po uh, populated by players who had very very long careers yes. and a lot Longevity of success. he was a massive factor i yeah. ranked very highly so for example like most people in the last couple of years they're gonna have to do like three times more than that like another name obviously potentially inspired one day he's got he's got yep. the skills to do it so but the problem is he hasn't done it yet yep so i think it's a, it's still a solid list but unfortunately not enough has changed and like the the new players that have been arriving in the last couple of years like you said maybe some of the rogue players maybe some of the mad lions players um they are just too new i mean vulcan is probably another name that may eventually be added to this list but it requires a lot more comp competitive play so way, probably as someone who actually knows history if i showed you the reddit threads to this series you would just quit reddit forever mate there was no rhyme or reason like for example they literally were doing stuff like diamond prox has to be top five based basically on like one year meanwhile people like um Froggen can't ever be in the top 10 like reckless must be like top three. Oh, it was all over the place like the logic made no it was everywhere bjergsen even though he's never done fuck all at worlds he has to be too like me what they literally did essentially is what they always do it's like i think he would beat him 
And then that was their list. And even though the whole thing was like, it's the entire history of League of Legends, they, they were all over it. It was mental, mate. You couldn't handle it. It was so bad. It was The response, actually, put it this way, I don't ever do anything for fans, but the response was so bad, I almost never wanted to do anything like this again to spite fans, which is very rare. I've ever had that feeling ever in my career. It was mental. <laughs> I've always said, by the way, people go, if it wasn't for the fans, I wouldn't do it. The fans are the only thing that's ever made me think of quitting. The only thing ever. They're the worst. They're the worst part of the job, yep. literally. Except for people who pay for my Patreon and Grogcoin holders. <laughs> See the way I saved that there? Saved it at the end. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm at a point in my career, uh, career where fortunately the fans are the worst part, but definitely there are some people I've had to work with in this industry that were way worse than the fans because they had much more direct effects on the amount of money I was getting paid or... Uh, selection for certain events that were just clueless, absolutely clueless, and not only clueless, but malicious motherfuckers. Um, so I'm glad to be mostly free of those people right now. Uh, unfortunately, many of my colleagues are not, and I pity them. Uh, you are challenged to a competition for your life. You get to pick the game, sport, etc., but it can't be esports related. What do you pick and why? As in, we're playing it, and if we have to win. Yeah, we have to win. So we have to pick a game, basically, that we are confident we would win in that would save our lives. Mm -hmm. Fuck, what game would that be? Because it can't be an esports game, so it's just some other sort of... Do, do, essentially, it doesn't have to be a video game, I'm guessing. It could just be any game, right? Yeah, or a sport. I mean, this is mad, because obviously I haven't got a great answer for this, so I'm just going to go with an absolutely ridiculous one, which is, do you know the game Knockout Wist? <laughs> no <laughs> you don't know oh, it's a, basically it's a card game where the premise is like the person who won the last hand gets to pick up the trump is which just means which suit of cards is right, like yeah. the one that automatically wins a hand instead of like and basically it's, it's just about strategy of how you play your hand because everyone's getting a different hand and it's about like when do you like spend the trump do you do it like really early on or do you like wait ages and bait people out all i'll say is that that game i'm just like oh, absurdly good i'll beat anyone in the world at so i mean to be fair not many people are playing it it's, it's a really old school game <laughs> destroy any of you at that game I'll, for my life i'll play that game and i'll even take the lock if i get a bad hand then that's how i go out because that's a metaphor for life it's just about how you play your hand <laughs> there you go reckless learn the lesson son who do you know, pick is there a game that you're good at i i think i'd probably have to take some sort of card or board game maybe hearts the card game which i've played an absurd amount of in my life so i think i i could probably take most people at that game um I wouldn't say I'm super great at it or anything like that. Uh, even in esports, I mean, I would I would definitely be reluctant to take an esports or a video game related to, you know, betting my life on it. And if it if I did, it would have to be an RTS game for me because that those were the games I was the best at. And if you beat someone for your life, would you say crushed dreams and broken hearts? <laughs> Uh, no, it's that, yeah, it's like that one. It's <laughs> um, a fucking mad callback. In that was like a season four callback. Absolute worst person you've ever encountered in esports that you Ooh. can name. That's going to oh. be hard. That's because by so the way, way it goes without people. saying we can't name like a rapist, yep. like people criminal. So we can't. We're going to have to basically go with somebody who publicly is pretty bad. Let me think. So I, I can. I could do this, but I'm going to have to think who it would be. The worst person. Absolute worst. Let me think. Unfortunately, I don't think I can actually name these people because of my current job. No, so but this, I, this I, would be one I, in the future. I just mean, I, like I said, I don't mean people who are actually agree. Just I mean people who are just like, just a fucking, just everything about them is just wrong. Let me think. Who would I pick for this? Because the obvious one would be like Nicola and I home from Australis. Basically, almost every word out the guy's mouth is a lie, and he knows it. That's why he's the worst. Like he's one of these people who just essentially doesn't believe in truth. He just he just believes in power dynamics, and he will use optics and whatever manipulative techniques he needs to get those ends done. Whereas that is obviously to completely counter to my philosophy. Like my philosophy, I know it might sound fucked. Is even if I could actually survive a situation by lying, I won't do it because I believe even to temporarily survive in the long run does actually essentially like taint your soul and will be crossing a Rubicon that will lead you down a path of lies and will eventually make you know everything you despise. So essentially sometimes it is better to die than to live and become what you hate. There you go. It's Not true. Bad. 
I, I mean, I, I think that there are just people, people, at least in the esports industry tend to be very short sighted. And I guess the, the definition of for me for like worst person in esports is probably like I just really dislike people that will they will put like really like corporations before themselves or their own ethics and they will they will do things that they know are wrong or that are bad for the long term health of esports because they want to save like a hundred bucks, right? And for their company not even for them. It's literally for a company that you know, like like Riot that has billions of dollars. So to me, that's like a, that's a very unique form of scumbaggery, uh, where you are, it, your motives are just completely unclear, and you are almost gambling on making a worse product because you don't want to tell your boss that you need to increase the budget by two thousand dollars. And well, I want so to change my answer. So we can keep going. Keep going. <laughs> but for something. me, like I just hate cowards. I really just fucking hate liars and cowards. And I really hate people that will not take any risks because they are concerned about what will happen to themselves. And, you know, maybe these people don't deserve my hate and I'm not going to name them, but that those are the absolute worst people to me. I'm going to change my answer. My answer is Slasher, the aforementioned Slasher, because this is someone who, this is not a joke, used an enormous social media following for two or three years to attempt to rabble rouse everyone in and outside of esports to hate me and want me removed from my job because I didn't want to be friends with him anymore. Yeah. I think that's worthy he of is a petty. He is, he is, and also I, I will say the thing about, I hate Slasher less than you do, but I, I, what what is egregious about Slasher is that he will he pre presents himself as a reporter, but he will he will make intentionally misleading takes on social yes. media because he's mad at you or because oh, he's he's trying to like stir the pot. So he presents himself as impartial and a journalist, but then does things and willfully misrepresents situations. And because I know him so well, I know he knows what the truth is. Um, in order to like score quick Twitter points, which is another like really bad personal quality. But God knows where he is now. He uh, he certainly he certainly got a lot of Twitter followers by uh, not revealing what happened to Dr. Disrespect and claiming he knew and then doing nothing with it. So that was pretty ethically questionable, too, where he's like, I know what happened, but I'm not going to tell you. And then farming Twitter followers. That was pretty immoral. <laughs> <laughs> that will be his epitaph. I know what happened to Dr. Disrespect. Yeah. Followed Notice by was... <laughs> people go, who is Slasher? And that'll be the end. Um, I actually don't know why he stopped posting. I, I never talked to him about it. So uh, this is the other side of the same question that was asked in the beginning of the group stage. Hypothetically, if there is no contract limbo, speculate whether a good world's performance affects team building for the other LCS, for the, other LCS the following season. Hold on. This was weird, worded weirdly. LCS teams, maybe you meant? Yeah. Uh, are there more purchases of refurbished hoodies, different choices of imports due to team factor style? Is there an incentive to pick up rookies? Um, does it terraform teams to resemble the current teams at World? So I guess he's saying how much of an effect um, would a good world's performance have on basically the formation of, of the other LCS teams in the league? I don't think any. Like, the problem is, uh, here's the thing. Uh, aside from maybe, like, G2 skewing the fact that people think they can go big, when you talk about LCS especially, I get the vibe that there is no looking at other teams. I think what happens is I think each GM does do what you in theory you might do, which is they think the decisions for themselves. It's just that depending on their budget, they do have a really bad trend of, like, recycling players that it's like, you're not going to be the seventh guy to pick this guy up and change who he is. So there is a lot. Like, that's why the joke is everyone's just taking a turn to have fucking Oni, haven't they? Everyone. And Dardock, like... Just never ends, does it? I I think the biggest factor affecting LCS team performance is that it's just an unwillingness to take risks, right? Um, and an unwillingness to do, to have a real farm system that develops players. So people feel locked into recycling players for eternity, basically, and never actually. I think we're starting to see that 
cycle break though, which is nice. Um, it is nice to, to see teams taking more risks and actually having development these days. So I, I hope LCS is changing for the better, but for a number of years, that was definitely the biggest factor. How much time should be spent on speculation for TL's performance had their JAT dilemma been handled differently and the team played with this whole roster the entire season? Obviously, the players need to own their personal performances, but would a better team cohesion make the difference with this caliber of players? Uh, all things oh, yeah, considered, I feel, oh, sorry, keep going. All things considered, I feel their performance in the group could have been much worse despite not getting out. I think they actually did okay at Worlds. You know what? You do know the consensus on Reddit, this is not a joke, is that I did make it all up and I just got lucky that actually other stuff happened with Jack Chelsea. That is for real, the consensus, it's mental. I know, isn't that mad? That's why I say what makes esports journalism suck is there is no scoreboard. So as I always say, it's like I scored 60 points and they went, you didn't score a single basket. You, you can't win. Well, you can't. You just don't do it for fans, do you? Of course, you do it for yourself. Basically, I would say uh, the Jack ones, neither here nor there. There's a world where Jack could have been a good coach. My problem is just the fact that, unfortunately, because of the thing with Santorin and then the Jenkins thing, it's that it's that they never got a full split with the team. I mean, fuck that. How about a yeah. whole year? Remember, they played the spring playoffs with a sub jungler as well. Like, yeah. if they could have had this real five man lineup for the whole year, I would be very interested to see because I actually think that's also why people writing off LCS was very weird to me. Because think about the three teams. LCS sent. A hundred thieves look like they'd plateaued before they ever set foot in Iceland. So I don't know why people expected more from them. I expected less. Cloud9 was all over the bloody place and just had a weird clutch factor that sometimes kicked in but weren't that good game to game. So actually they had chances to potentially improve. And then Team Liquid, as we said, barely used the same lineup in actual playoff settings and were pretty good generally, had a decent high level and just fucked it up in the final. So actually I thought TL had the best chances to like overall be better and Cloud9 had an outside chance. So, I, so a lot of that played out I kind of expected. So to me, yeah, I think people, I think Team Liquid was written off way too easy. As I said in when this group was outlined in the first place, their players individually are way too good to be told they're going to go zero six 6 in a group like this no we That's talked ridiculous. about it we talked about it in our, our predictions but there is a world where team liquid got out of this group in fact they very nearly did there's a world where they win that game in the tiebreaker series versus gen g they were close to doing it there's a world where they don't draw gen g and they they draw one of the other two teams in this group and they they end up beating mad lions or lng and then making it into the top two seats i think all possibilities were on the board here for them um I think they had the players and the meta to do it. I think Jensen played super well in the second round Robin. So I guess, I guess for me, like they probably would have gotten out of this group had they had more cohesion for the entire year. That's, I would have loved it if the tiebreaker first round had been TL Mad Lions. That's the match I wanted to see again. Yeah. Would have been fun to, bangers. Yeah. Would have been fun to see for sure. Uh, so I think the roster on paper is still extremely good for team liquid. I hope they don't make that many changes and they actually get these players to play together uh, next year for the entire year because it felt like they never really got their shot, which is unfortunate. All right, final question. If a Grog coin existed, what would be on the front and back? <laughs> Probably the like esports to lend ast. That's a good one. Esports to lend ast yeah, with like a, a, a cup of grog. I like the the troll thorn face where you're like, Pretty that would good. be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd put that on there for sure. I don't know. Maybe we should mint some grog coins. That's a, that's a merchandise possibility. Just uh, have alternative grog coins uh, and just make a new one every year with different images on them. Collectible. Also, it could have like you know around the coin, it could say chronicling TSM's downfall since 2014 <laughs> or something like that. You know, we there should we know. should we should make like a commemoration coin of the victory of the TSM Holy War. You yes. know, Thorne, we need more Holy Wars. When's we our do. when is our score the score esports Holy War coming? Because those those motherfuckers need to be crusaded on. Sure. <laughs> well, we'll do it when whatever our upcoming new project is. I'm not going to reveal. <laughs> <laughs> potentially we will go into that area and we might just eat their fucking lunch directly off their plate as they've been doing to me for the last two years. So we'll just be nice to have the budget and just, just beat them at their own game, wouldn't it? It would be. It would be for sure. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there are many other holy wars that need to, need to happen within the esports space. And we'll, we'll have the, uh, we'll have the Pope's budget maybe to do that in the near future. We'll see. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of Summoning Insight. Next episode will be, 
sometime after the quarters. I'm quarters. Guessing. So the quarterfinals end on Monday. So uh, it will depend on Thorin's schedule at the major uh, when the next episode yes. will be. So keep It'll an eye on Twitter. That, I'm guessing though. Yeah, well, it, it, it'll be uh, it'll be sometime then. So once once Thorin has a better idea of when he's working, we'll be able to schedule around that. It might be at a, a different time. It might be at a weird time. Who knows? So keep an eye on our Twitters, and that will be the place where we announce this or follow the channel. And when you get that notification that it goes live, probably the show's there. Subscribe on YouTube as well, obviously, um, or podcast platforms. All right, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.